Hegemony or Survival, America's Quest for Global Dominance. Book by Noam Chomsky. Audiobook by the Learner's Library. Chapter 4. Dangerous Times. Chapter 5. The Iraq Connection. Chapter 6. Dilemmas of Dominance. Chapter 4. Dangerous Times. Concern about current threats is widespread and realistic. In February 2002 the famous Doomsday Clock of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists was advanced two minutes toward midnight, even before the release of the Bush administration's National Security Strategy and Nuclear Posture Review, which elicited shudders worldwide. With different threats in mind, strategic analyst Michael Crapon regarded the final days of 2002 as the most dangerous time since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. A high-level task force concluded that, we are entering a time of especially grave danger, as we are preparing to attack a ruthless adversary, Iraq, who may well have access to, weapons of mass destruction. Such dangers are likely to become even more grave in the longer term as a consequence of the easy resort to violence, as many have pointed out. The reasons behind these concerns merit close attention but too narrow a focus can be misleading. We can gain a more realistic perspective on them by asking why the Cuban Missile Crisis was such a dangerous time. The answers bear directly on the perils ahead. One word away from nuclear war. The Missile Crisis was the most dangerous moment in human history. Arthur Schlesinger commented in October 2002 at a conference in Havana on the 40th anniversary of the crisis, attended by a number of those who witnessed it from within as it unfolded. Decision-makers at the time undoubtedly understood that the fate of the world was in their hands. Nevertheless, attendees at the conference may have been shocked by some of the revelations. They were informed that in October 1962 the world was, one word away, from nuclear war. A guy named Arkhipov saved the world, said Thomas Blanton of the National Security Archive in Washington, which helped organize the event. He was referring to Vasily Arkhipov, a Soviet submarine officer who blocked an order to fire nuclear-armed torpedoes on October 27. At the tensest moment of the crisis, when the submarines were under attack by U.S. destroyers, a devastating response would have been a near certainty, leading to a major war. Participants in the decisions at the time, and at the retrospective 40 years later, did not have to be reminded of President Eisenhower's warning that a major war would destroy the Northern Hemisphere. The parallel between Kennedy's handling of the crisis and President Bush's deliberations over Iraq was a recurrent theme. At the meeting, the press reported, with many participants accusing Bush of ignoring history, saying, they had come to make sure it does not happen again, and to offer lessons for today's crises, most notably President George W. Bush's deliberations about whether to strike Iraq. Schlesinger was surely not the only one to bring up the fact that Kennedy chose quarantine as an alternative to military action, while Bush is committed to military action, nor, presumably, was he the only one to have been taken aback to learn just how close the world came to destruction even under the less aggressive choice. In his authoritative account of the missile crisis, Raymond Garthoff observes that, in the United States, there was almost universal approbation for President Kennedy's handling of the crisis. That's a fair assessment, though whether the approval is warranted is a separate question. The confrontation finally came down to two basic issues. One, would Kennedy pledge that the U.S. would not invade Cuba? And, two, would he make a public announcement that the U.S. would withdraw its Jupiter nuclear missiles from Turkey? on the border of Russia and aimed at its heartland? On both issues, Kennedy ultimately refused.
he agreed only to a secret commitment to withdraw the missiles, which had in any case already been scheduled to be replaced by Polaris nuclear submarines. He refused to make any formal commitment not to invade Cuba. Rather, he continued to conduct an active policy of seeking to undermine and displace the Castro regime, including covert operations against Cuba, Garthoff observes. In a highly provocative gesture as the crisis intensified, the missiles were turned over to Turkish command, with ceremonial fanfare, on October 22. Garthoff comments, the event was certainly noted in Moscow, but not in Washington. There it was presumably regarded as just another exercise of logical illogicality. As history is crafted by the powerful, the most dramatic moment of the missile crisis was provided by UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson at the Security Council, on October 25, when he exposed Soviet deception by unveiling a photograph of a missile site in Cuba taken by U.S. spy planes. The concept, Stevenson moment, has entered into historical memory, in celebration of this victory over a vicious foe aiming to destroy us. As an intellectual exercise, let's imagine how the Stevenson moment might be viewed by a hypothetical extraterrestrial observer. Call him Martian, and assume that he is free from earthly systems of doctrine and ideology. Martian would surely note that there is no Khrushchev moment in history, no moment at which Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev or his UN ambassador dramatically unveiled photographs of the Jupiter missiles, placed in Turkey in 1961-62, or of the provocative transfer of the missiles to the Turkish military with ceremonial fanfare, just as the most dangerous moment in human history approached. Reflecting on this distinction, Martian should recall that the Jupiter missiles were only a small element of a far greater threat to Russia, and that Russia had repeatedly been invaded and almost destroyed in the preceding half-century, twice by newly rearmed Germany, its richer western part now within a hostile military alliance led by the world's mightiest superpower, once in 1918 by Britain, the US, and their allies and he might observe that there was, of course, no Russian threat to invade Turkey, nor any large-scale Russian terrorist campaign or economic warfare against Turkey, nor even a lesser counterpart to the crimes that the Kennedy administration was carrying out against Cuba at the time. Despite all this, only the Stevenson moment exists in historical memory. Martian would surely grasp how the distinction reflects the balance of global power. He would also presumably recall a principle that must be close to a historical universal of intellectual culture. We are a good, whoever we happen to be, and they are evil if they stand in our way. Therefore, the radical asymmetry makes perfect sense, within the framework of established doctrine. The contours of the asymmetry become even sharper when we consider the occasional effort at extenuation. The crime of the Russians in Cuba was stealth, while the U.S. surrounded Russia with lethal offensive weapons quite openly. That is true. The world ruler not only has no need to conceal its intent, but prefers to advertise it, to maintain credibility. The subordination of the ideological system to power ensures that virtually any action, international terrorism, as in Cuba, overt aggression, as in South Vietnam at the same time, participation in mass slaughter to destroy the only mass-based political party, as in South Vietnam and Indonesia, and many others, will either be dispatched to oblivion or reshaped into an act of legitimate self-defense or an act of benevolence that perhaps went astray. The importance of owning a properly crafted history was revealed once again in February 2003, when Colin Powell addressed the UN Security Council, informing its members that the US would go to war with or without UN authorization.
The question pondered by commentators was whether Powell would be able to provide a Stevenson moment. Some thought he had. New York Times columnist William Sapphire triumphantly reported Powell's Adlai Stevenson moment, a satellite image of trucks next to a bunker allegedly storing chemical weapons, then another with the trucks gone, clear proof that Iraq had deceived the inspectors by removing the illegal weapons before they arrived, and that the devious Iraqis had penetrated the inspection team confirming the U.S. thesis that the team was unreliable and hence could not be provided with intelligence data that Washington claimed to have. It was later conceded, with Powell's silent nod of agreement, that for a range of reasons, the time lapse between the taking of the photos, the uncertain use of the site in question, the photographs proved nothing, one of a series of similar cases, which later became a torrent. Still, this was deemed a Stevenson moment, though Adam Clymer pointed out that there was a stark difference between the two. Stevenson's moment was one of real fear about Soviet missiles, of imminent nuclear confrontation. Apparently, there could have been no fear, anywhere, about missiles on the Russian border. Stevenson's son felt that the differences were even starker. His father had presented the Security Council with proof that a nuclear superpower was installing missiles in Cuba and threatening to upset the world's balance of terror, or, from Martian standpoint, threatening to shift the world's balance of terror to be a little less extreme in Washington's favor. And, he continued, that moment had an obvious purpose, containing the Soviet Union and maintaining peace. In Martian translation, the Stevenson moment did contribute to a partial containment, but of Washington, not the USSR. A possible invasion of Cuba was averted, though Washington's international terrorist campaign and economic warfare were resumed at once, and the threat to Russia was escalated, all of which takes on greater significance against the background of superpower interchanges at the time, to which we return. Kennedy had no doubts about the threat of the Russian missiles in Cuba. Meeting with his high-level advisors, XCOM, he said, it's just as if we suddenly began to put a major number of medium-range ballistic missiles in Turkey. Now that'd be goddamn dangerous. His national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, responded, well, we did, Mr. President. Surprised, JFK said. But that was five years ago, actually, one year ago, during his administration. He later expressed concern that if the facts were known, his decision to risk war rather than agree publicly to joint withdrawal of missiles from Cuba and Turkey would not play well in Peoria. He feared most people would consider it a very fair trade. Whatever one's judgment about the actions of Khrushchev and Kennedy, there should be universal agreement that Khrushchev's decision to dispatch the missiles to Cuba was an act of criminal lunacy, in the light of the possible consequences. It would pass beyond lunacy to condemn those who warned of the dangers and criticized Khrushchev bitterly for proceeding despite the risks. It is the merest truism that choices are assessed in terms of the range of likely consequences. We understand the truism very well when considering the actions of official enemies but find it hard to apply to ourselves. There are many illustrations, including recent U.S. military exercises. Aid agencies, scholars, and others who properly warned of the risks in Afghanistan and Iraq were ridiculed when the worst, fortunately, did not come to pass. At the same level of moral imbecility, one would rush into the streets every October to sing praises to the Kremlin, while ridiculing those who warned of the dangers of placing missiles in Cuba and persist in condemning the criminal lunacy of the act. Kennedy officials state that the president had not authorized an invasion of Cuba. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, however, informed his cabinet associates on October 22, 1962, 
that the president ordered us to prepare an invasion months ago. And we have developed plans in great detail, fully enough so that an invasion could be launched in a week. At the 40th anniversary conference, McNamara reiterated his view that Cuba was justified in fearing an attack. If I were in Cuban or Soviet shoes, I would have thought so, too, he said. What took place, and the background for it, most definitely does offer lessons for today's crises, as participants in the October 2002 retrospective insisted. While this may well have been the most dangerous moment in human history, it is not the only such case of flirting with catastrophe. More generally, it is far from the only illustration of unanticipated and unpredictable consequences of the resort to, or even the threat of, force, among the many reasons why sane people understand it to be a last resort, facing a very heavy burden of proof. Other lessons bear directly on conflicted U.S. relations with Europe, another topical matter at the anniversary meeting. The missile crisis suggests some reasons why Europeans might be wary of the U.S. political leadership, in that case, not radical right nationalists but those at the liberal, multilateral end of the political spectrum. Europe's fate was hanging in the balance as the president and his advisers decided to reject what they feared would be regarded as a fair trade if it were known. But Europe was kept in the dark and treated with disdain. Kennedy's XCOM summarily dismissed any idea of sharing with the Allies decisions that could have led to the nuclear destruction of Western Europe, as well as North America. Frank Costagliola writes in a rare study of the topic. Kennedy told his Secretary of State privately that allies must come along or stay behind. We cannot accept a veto from any other power, words heard again 40 years later from Bush and Powell. The U.S. commander of NATO put its air forces on alert without consultation with Europe. Kennedy's closest ally, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, told his associates that Kennedy's actions were escalating into war, but he could do nothing to stop T. He knew only what he could learn from British intelligence. Washington's perception of the U.S.-U.K. special relationship was articulated by a senior Kennedy adviser in internal discussion at the peak of the crisis, Britain will act as our lieutenant, the fashionable word is partner. McGeorge Bundy suggested that some effort be made to encourage Europeans to feel that they're a part of it, real that they know but only in order to keep them quiet. Europeans are not capable of the rational and logical approach of American decision-makers, his aide Robert Comer advised. If European leaders found out what was happening, Bundy added, they might make noise saying that they can live with Soviet, medium-range ballistic missiles, why can't we? The word noise connotes discordant, unintelligent clamor, Castigliola adds. Perhaps many Europeans might not be too happy about the significance accorded their survival, even if respected U.S. commentators are confident that their reluctance to come along is a sign of paranoid anti-Americanism, ignorance and avarice, and other cultural deficiencies. International terrorism dominated the headlines as the retrospective conference took place so did Washington's allegedly novel doctrine of regime change. But there is little novel here. The Cuban Missile Crisis grew directly out of a campaign of international terrorism aimed at forceful regime change. Historian Thomas Patterson concludes, quite plausibly, that the origins of the October 1962 crisis derived largely from the concerted U.S. campaign to quash the Cuban Revolution by violence and economic warfare. We can gain a better insight into current implications by looking at how the crisis evolved, and the guiding principles that motivated policy. International Terrorism and Regime Change, Cuba
The Batista dictatorship was overthrown in January 1959 by Castro's guerrilla forces. In March, the National Security Council, NSC, considered means to institute regime change. In May, the CIA began to arm guerrillas inside Cuba. During the winter of 1959 to 1960, there was a significant increase in CIA supervised bombing and incendiary raids piloted by exiled Cubans, based in the U.S. Point 13 we need not tarry on what the U.S. or its clients would do under such circumstances. Cuba, however, did not respond with violent actions within the United States for revenge or deterrence. Rather, it followed the procedure required by international law. In July 1960, Cuba called on the UN for help, providing the Security Council with records of some 20 bombings, including names of pilots, plane registration numbers, unexploded bombs, and other specific details, alleging considerable damage and casualties and calling for resolution of the conflict through diplomatic channels. U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge responded by giving his assurance that the United States has no aggressive purpose against Cuba. Four months before, in March 1960, his government had made a formal decision in secret to overthrow the Castro government, and preparations for the Bay of Pigs invasion were well advanced. Washington was concerned that Cubans might try to defend themselves. CIA Chief Alan Dulles therefore urged Britain not to provide arms to Cuba. His a main reason, the British ambassador reported to London, was that this might lead the Cubans to ask for Soviet or Soviet bloc arms, a move that would have a tremendous effect, Dulles pointed out, allowing Washington to portray Cuba as a security threat to the hemisphere, following the script that had worked so well in Guatemala. Dulles was referring to Washington's successful demolition of Guatemala's first democratic experiment, a ten-year interlude of hope and progress, greatly feared in Washington because of the enormous popular support reported by U.S. intelligence and the demonstration effect of social and economic measures to benefit the large majority. The Soviet threat was routinely invoked abetted by Guatemala's appeal to the Soviet bloc for arms after the U.S. had threatened attack and cut off other sources of supply. The result was a half. Century of horror, even worse than the U.S.-backed tyranny that came before. For Cuba, the schemes devised by the Doves were similar to those of CIA Director Dulles. Warning President Kennedy about the inevitable political and diplomatic fallout from the planned invasion of Cuba by a proxy army. Arthur Schlesinger suggested efforts to trap Castro in some action that could be used as a pretext for invasion. One can conceive a black operation in, say, Haiti which might in time lure Castro into sending a few boatloads of men onto a Haitian beach in what could be portrayed as an effort to overthrow the Haitian regime, then the moral issue would be clouded and the anti-U.S. campaign would be hobbled from the start. References to the regime of the murderous dictator, Papa Doc Duvalier, which was backed by the U.S., with some reservations, so that an effort to help Haitians overthrow it would be a crime. Eisenhower's March 1960 plan called for the overthrow of Castro in favor of a regime more devoted to the true interests of the Cuban people and more acceptable to the U.S., including support for military operation on the island, and development of an adequate paramilitary force outside of Cuba. Intelligence reported that popular support for Castro was high, but the U.S. would determine the true interests of the Cuban people. The regime change was to be carried out, in such a manner as to avoid any appearance of U.S. intervention, because of the anticipated reaction in Latin America and the problems of doctrinal management at home. The Bay of Pigs invasion came a year later, in April 1961, after Kennedy had taken office. 
It was authorized in an atmosphere of hysteria over Cuba in the White House, Robert McNamara later testified before the Senate's Church Committee. At the first cabinet meeting after the failed invasion, the atmosphere was almost savage, Chester Bowles noted privately. There was an almost frantic reaction for an action program. At an NSC meeting two days later, Bowles found the atmosphere almost as emotional and was struck by the great lack of moral integrity that prevailed. The mood was reflected in Kennedy's public pronouncements, the complacent, the self-indulgent, the soft societies are about to be swept away with the debris of history. Only the strong can possibly survive, he told the country, sounding a theme that would be used to good effect by the Reaganites during their own terrorist wars. Kennedy was aware that allies think that we're slightly demented on the subject of Cuba, a perception that persists to the present. Kennedy implemented a crushing embargo that could scarcely be endured by a small country that had become a virtual colony of the U.S. in the 60 years following its liberation from Spain. He also ordered an intensification of the terrorist campaign. He asked his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, to lead the top-level interagency group that oversaw Operation Mongoose, a program of paramilitary operations, economic warfare, and sabotage he launched in late 1961 to visit the terrors of the earth on Fidel Castro and, more prosaically, to topple him. The terrorist campaign was no laughing matter. Jorge Dominguez writes in a review of recently declassified materials on operations under Kennedy, materials that are heavily sanitized and only the tip of the iceberg, Piero Glygesis adds. Operation Mongoose was the centerpiece of American policy toward Cuba from late 1961 until the onset of the 1962 missile crisis. Mark White reports, the program on which the Kennedy brothers came to pin their hopes. Robert Kennedy informed the CIA that the Cuban problem carries the top priority in the United States government. All else is secondary, no time, no effort, or manpower is to be spared in the effort to overthrow the Castro regime. The chief of Mongoose operations, Edward Lansdale, provided a timetable leading to open revolt and overthrow of the communist regime in October 1962. The final definition of the program recognized that final success will require decisive U.S. military intervention after terrorism and subversion had laid the basis. The implication is that U.S. military intervention would take place in October 1962, when the missile crisis erupted. In February 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff approved a plan more extreme than Schlesinger's, to use covert means, to lure or provoke Castro, or an uncontrollable subordinate, into an overt hostile reaction against the United States, a reaction which would in turn create the justification for the U.S. to not only retaliate but destroy Castro with speed, force and determination. In March, at the request of the DoD Cuba Project, the Joint Chiefs of Staff submitted a memorandum to Defense Secretary Robert McNamara outlining pretexts which they would consider would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. The plan would be undertaken if a credible internal revolt is impossible of attainment during the next nine to ten months, but before Cuba could establish relations with Russia that might directly involve the Soviet Union. A prudent resort to terror should avoid risk to the perpetrator. The March plan was to construct seemingly unrelated events to camouflage the ultimate objective and create the necessary impression of Cuban rashness and responsibility on a large scale, directed at other countries as well as the United States, placing the U.S. in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances and developing an international image of Cuban threat to peace in the Western Hemisphere.
proposed measures included blowing up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay to create a Remember the Main incident, publishing casualty lists in U.S. newspapers to cause a helpful wave of national indignation, portraying Cuban investigations as fairly compelling evidence that the ship was taken under attack, developing a communist Cuban terror campaign in Florida, and even in Washington, using Soviet bloc incendiaries for cane, burning raids in neighboring countries, shooting down a drone aircraft with a pretense that it was a charter flight carrying college students on a holiday, and other similarly ingenious schemes, not implemented, but another sign of the frantic and is savage atmosphere that prevailed. On August 23, the president issued National Security Memorandum No. 181, a directive to engineer an internal revolt that would be followed by U.S. military intervention, involving significant U.S. military plans, maneuvers, and movement of forces and equipment that were surely known to Cuba and Russia. Also in August, terrorist attacks were intensified, including speedboat strafing attacks on a Cuban seaside hotel, where Soviet military technicians were known to congregate, killing a score of Russians and Cubans, attacks on British and Cuban cargo ships, the contamination of sugar shipments, and other atrocities and sabotage, mostly carried out by Cuban exile organizations permitted to operate freely in Florida. A few weeks later came the most dangerous moment in human history. Terrorist operations continued through the tensest moments of the missile crisis. They were formally canceled on October 30, several days after the Kennedy and Khrushchev agreement, but went on nonetheless. On November 8, a Cuban covert action sabotage team dispatched from the United States successfully blew up a Cuban industrial facility, killing 400 workers, according to the Cuban government. Raymond Garthoff writes that the Soviets could only see the attack as an effort to backpedal on what was, for them, the key question remaining, American assurances not to attack Cuba. These and other actions reveal again, he concludes, that the risk and danger to both sides could have been extreme, and catastrophe not excluded. After the crisis ended, Kennedy renewed the terrorist campaign. Ten days before his assassination he approved a CIA plan for destruction operations by U.S. proxy forces against a large oil refinery and storage facilities, a large electric plant, sugar refineries, railroad bridges, harbor facilities, and underwater demolition of docks and ships. A plot to kill Castro was initiated on the day of the Kennedy assassination. The campaign was called off in 1965, but, one of Nixon's first acts in office in 1969 was to direct the CIA to intensify covert operations against Cuba. Of particular interest are the perceptions of the planners. In his review of recently released documents on Kennedy-era terror, Dominguez observes that, only once in these nearly thousand pages of documentation, did a U.S. official raise something that resembled a faint moral objection to U.S. government-sponsored terrorism. A member of the NSC staff suggested that it might lead to some Russian reaction, and raids that are haphazard and kill innocents, might mean a bad press in some friendly countries. The same attitudes prevail throughout the internal discussions, as when Robert Kennedy warned that a full-scale invasion of Cuba would kill an awful lot of people, and we're going to take an awful lot of heat on it. Terrorist activities continued under Nixon, peaking in the mid-1970s, with attacks on fishing boats, embassies, and Cuban offices overseas, and the bombing of a Cubana airliner, killing all 73 passengers. These and subsequent terrorist operations were carried out from U.S. territory, though by then they were regarded as criminal acts by the FBI. So matters proceeded, while Castro was condemned by editors for maintaining an armed camp.
despite the security from attack promised by Washington in 1962. The promise should have sufficed, despite what followed, not to speak of the promises that preceded, by then well documented, along with information about how well they could be trusted, example, the Balage moment of July 1960. On the 30th anniversary of the missile crisis, Cuba protested a machine gun attack against a Spanish Cuban tourist hotel. Responsibility was claimed by a group in Miami. Bombings in Cuba in 1997, which killed an Italian tourist, were traced back to Miami. The perpetrators were Salvadoran criminals operating under the direction of Luis Posada Carrils and financed in Miami. One of the most notorious international terrorists, Posada had escaped from a Venezuelan prison, where he had been held for the Cubana airliner bombing, with the aid of Jorge Moscanosa, a Miami businessman who was the head of the tax-exempt Cuban American National Foundation, CANF. Posada went from Venezuela to El Salvador, where he was put to work at the Ilopango military air base to help organize U.S. terrorist attacks against Nicaragua, under Oliver North's direction. Posada has described in detail his terrorist activities and the funding for them from exiles and CANF in Miami, but felt secure that he would not be investigated by the FBI. He was a Bay of Pigs veteran, and his subsequent operations in the 1960s were directed by the CIA. When he later joined Venezuelan intelligence with CIA help, he was able to arrange for Orlando Bosch, an associate from his CIA days who had been convicted in the U.S. for a bomb attack on a Cuba-bound freighter, to join him in Venezuela to organize further attacks against Cuba. An ex-CIA official familiar with the Cubana bombing identifies Posada and Bosch as the only suspects in the bombing, which Bosch defended as a legitimate act of war. Generally considered the mastermind of the airline bombing, Bosch was responsible for 30 other acts of terrorism, according to the FBI. He was granted a presidential pardon in 1989 by the incoming Bush I administration after intense lobbying by Jeb Bush and South Florida Cuban-American leaders, overruling the Justice Department, which had found the conclusion, inescapable that it would be prejudicial to the public interest for the United States to provide a safe haven for Bosch, because, the security of this nation is affected by its ability to urge credibly other nations to refuse aid and shelter to terrorists. Cuban offers to cooperate in intelligence sharing to prevent terrorist attacks have been rejected by Washington, though some did lead to U.S. actions. Senior members of the FBI visited Cuba in 1998 to meet their Cuban counterparts, who gave the FBI dossiers about what they suggested was a Miami-based terrorist network information which had been compiled in part by Cubans who had infiltrated exile groups. Three months later the FBI arrested Cubans who had infiltrated the U.S.-based terrorist groups. Five were sentenced to long terms in prison. The national security pretext lost whatever shreds of credibility it might have had after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1991, though it was not until 1998 that U.S. intelligence officially informed the country that Cuba no longer posed a threat to U.S. national security. The Clinton administration, however, insisted that the military threat posed by Cuba be reduced to negligible, but not completely removed. Even with this qualification, the intelligence assessment eliminated a danger that had been identified by the Mexican ambassador in 1961, when he rejected JFK's attempt to organize collective action against Cuba on the grounds that, if we publicly declare that Cuba is a threat to our security, 40 million Mexicans will die laughing. In fairness, however, it should be recognized that missiles in Cuba did pose a threat.
In private discussions the Kennedy brothers expressed their fears that the presence of Russian missiles in Cuba might deter a U.S. invasion of Venezuela. So, the Bay of Pigs was really right, JFK concluded. The Bush I administration reacted to the elimination of the security pretext by making the embargo much harsher, under pressure from Clinton, who outflanked Bush from the right during the 1992 election campaign. Economic Warfare was made still more stringent in 1996, causing a furor even among the closest U.S. allies. The embargo came under considerable domestic criticism as well, on the grounds that it harms U.S. exporters and investors, the embargo's only victims. According to the standard picture in the U.S., Cubans are unaffected. Investigations by U.S. specialists tell a different story. Thus, a detailed study by the American Association for World Health concluded that the embargo had severe health effects and only Cuba's remarkable healthcare system had prevented a humanitarian catastrophe. This has received virtually no mention in the U.S. The embargo has effectively barred even food and medicine. In 1999 the Clinton administration eased such sanctions for all countries on the official list of terrorist states, apart from Cuba, singled out for unique punishment. Nevertheless, Cuba is not entirely alone in this regard. After a hurricane devastated West Indian Islands in August 1980, President Carter refused to allow any aid unless Grenada was excluded, as punishment for some unspecified initiatives of the reformist Maurice Bishop government. When the stricken countries refused to agree to Grenada's exclusion, Having failed to perceive the threat to survival posed by the nutmeg capital of the world, Carter withheld all aid. Similarly, when Nicaragua was struck by a hurricane in October 1988, bringing starvation and causing severe ecological damage, the current incumbents in Washington recognized that their terrorist war could benefit from the disaster, and therefore refused aid even to the Atlantic coast area with close links to the U.S. and deep resentment against the Sandinistas. They followed suit when a tidal wave wiped out Nicaraguan fishing villages, leaving hundreds dead and missing in September 1992. In this case, there was a show of aid, but hidden in the small print was the fact that apart from an impressive donation of $25,000, the aid was deducted from assistance already scheduled. Congress was assured, however, that the pittance of aid would not affect the administration's suspension of over $100 million of aid, because the U.S.-backed Nicaraguan government had failed to demonstrate a sufficient degree of subservience. U.S. economic warfare against Cuba has been strongly condemned in virtually every relevant international forum even declared illegal by the Judicial Commission of the Normally Compliant Organization of American States. The European Union called on the World Trade Organization to condemn the embargo. The response of the Clinton administration was that, Europe is challenging, three decades of American-Cuba policy that goes back to the Kennedy administration, and is aimed entirely at forcing a change of government in Havana. The administration also declared that the WTO has no competence to rule on U.S. national security, or to compel the U.S. to change its laws. Washington then withdrew from the proceedings, rendering the matter moot. Successful Defiance The reasons for the international terrorist attacks against Cuba and the illegal economic embargo are spelled out in the internal record. And no one should be surprised to discover that they fit a familiar pattern, that of Guatemala a few years earlier, for example. From the timing alone, it is clear that concern over a Russian threat could not have been a major factor. The plans for forceful regime change were drawn up and implemented before there was any significant Russian connection.
and punishment was intensified after the Russians disappeared from the scene. True, a Russian threat did develop, but that was more a consequence than a cause of U.S. terrorism and economic warfare. In July 1961 the CIA warned that the extensive influence of Castroism is not a function of Cuban power. Castro's shadow looms large because social and economic conditions throughout Latin America invite opposition to ruling authority and encourage agitation for radical change, for which Castro's Cuba provided a model. Earlier, Arthur Schlesinger had transmitted to the incoming President Kennedy his Latin American mission report, which warned of the susceptibility of Latin Americans to the Castro idea of taking matters into one's own hands. The report did identify a Kremlin connection, the Soviet Union hovers in the wings, flourishing large development loans and presenting itself as the model for achieving modernization in a single generation. The dangers of the Castro idea are particularly grave, Schlesinger later elaborated, when the distribution of land and other forms of national wealth greatly favors the propertied classes and the poor and underprivileged, stimulated by the example of the Cuban Revolution, are now demanding opportunities for a decent living. Kennedy feared that Russian aid might make Cuba a showcase for development giving the Soviets the upper hand throughout Latin America. In early 1964, the State Department Policy Planning Council expanded on these concerns. The primary danger we face in Castro is, in the impact the very existence of his regime has upon the leftist movement in many Latin American countries the simple fact is that Castro represents a successful defiance of the U.S., a negation of our whole hemispheric policy of almost a century and a half. To put it simply, Thomas Patterson writes, Cuba, as symbol and reality, challenged U.S. hegemony in Latin America. International terrorism and economic warfare to bring about regime change are justified not by what Cuba does, but by its very existence, its successful defiance of the proper master of the hemisphere. Defiance may justify even more violent actions, as in Serbia, as quietly conceded after the fact, or Iraq, as also recognized when pretexts had collapsed. Outrage over defiance goes far back in American history. Two hundred years ago, Thomas Jefferson bitterly condemned France for its attitude of defiance in holding New Orleans, which he coveted. Jefferson warned that France's a character is placed in a point of eternal friction with our character, which though loving peace and the pursuit of wealth, is high-minded. France's a defiance requires us to marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation, Jefferson advised, reversing his earlier attitudes, which reflected France's crucial contribution to the liberation of the colonies from British rule. Thanks to Haiti's liberation struggle, unaided and almost universally opposed, France's defiance soon ended, but the guiding principles remain in force, determining friend and foe. Guiding Principles The principles illustrated in the Missile Crisis explain why international law is irrelevant. Domestic law was also declared irrelevant. Rejecting a 1961 legal brief that held the Bay of Pigs invasion to be a violation of U.S. neutrality laws, Attorney General Robert Kennedy determined that the U.S. run forces were patriots. Therefore none of their activities appear to be violations of our neutrality laws, which uh, clearly were not designed for the kind of situation which exists in the world today. The world did not suddenly become extraordinarily dangerous on 9 to 11, requiring new paradigms that dismantle international law and institutions and grant the White House the power to disregard the domestic rule of law. The achievements of international terrorism are excluded from sanitized history, but they are recognized with pride by the perpetrators.
the famous School of the Americas, which trains Latin American officers to carry out their missions, proudly announces as one of its talking points that the U.S. Army helped to defeat liberation theology, the heresy to which the Latin American Church succumbed when it adopted the preferential option for the poor, and was made to suffer its own terrors of the earth for this departure from good. Order. Symbolically, the grim decade of Reagan-Bush I terror was opened, shortly before they took office, by the assassination of a conservative Salvadoran archbishop who had become a, a voice for the voiceless, with thinly veiled complicity of the U.S.-backed security forces, and the decade closed with the murder of six Jesuit Salvadoran intellectuals whose brains were blown out, and their housekeeper and her daughter murdered by an elite Washington-armed and trained battalion that had already compiled a record of bloody atrocities. The significance of these events in Western culture is illustrated by the fact that the work of these troublesome priests is unread, and their names unknown, in sharp contrast to their counterparts under Kremlin rule. They were thus doubly assassinated, murdered and forgotten. In fact, the corpses received another kick in the face. Immediately after the murders, Voslav Havel visited Washington to speak at a joint session of Congress, where he received a standing ovation for praising the defenders of freedom, who, he and his audience surely knew, had armed and trained the assassins of the six leading Latin American intellectuals, while leaving a bloody trail of the usual victims. His praise for our glorious selves after these achievements won rapturous acclaim from leading liberal commentators, who saw in it more signs that we are entering a romantic age, Anthony Lewis, and were awed by his voice of conscience that speaks compellingly of the responsibilities that large and small powers owe each other, Washington Post editors. But not the responsibility that the U.S. owes to the people of Central America at least those who survived the murderous onslaught of the 1980s. In the case of Cuba, successful defiance elicited reactions that brought the world close to destruction. But that is unusual. Successful defiance has regularly been overcome by one or another form of violence without any risk to the perpetrators. One strategy from the early 1960s was the installation of neo-Nazi national security states, which had as their goal to destroy permanently a perceived threat to the existing structure of socio-economic privilege, by eliminating the political participation of the numerical majority, that is, the popular classes. The move set off a plague of repression and terror throughout the continent, reaching Central America during the Reaganite phase of the current political leadership. The plague began with the military coup in Brazil set in motion before Kennedy's assassination and carried out shortly after. Washington cooperated with the military forces that overthrew parliamentary democracy in recognition of their basically democratic and pro-United States orientation, Kennedy's ambassador Lincoln Gordon explained. While the torturers and assassins were carrying out their work, Gordon hailed the most decisive victory for freedom in the mid-20th century. The Democratic Rebellion, Gordon cabled Washington, would help in restraining left-wing excesses of the former moderate populist elected government, and the Democratic forces now in charge should create a greatly improved climate for private investment. Gordon's view was endorsed by other leading figures of the Kennedy-Johnson administrations, though by the 1980s, as in Chile at the same time, the Brazilian generals were happy to transfer the wreckage to civilian hands. Despite the enormous advantages of the Colossus of the South, the generals had left Brazil in the same category as the less developed African or Asian countries when it came to social welfare indices, malnutrition, infant mortality, etc., with conditions of inequality and suffering rarely matched elsewhere, but a grand success for foreign investors and domestic privilege.
these patterns have not been restricted to the domains of the Monroe Doctrine. To take one of many examples from other parts of the world, while Washington was facilitating the Democratic Rebellion in Brazil and seeking to overcome Cuba's efforts to take matters into its own hands, Elder Statesman Ellsworth Bunker was sent to Indonesia to investigate troubling conditions there. He informed Washington that the avowed Indonesian objective is to stand on their own feet in developing their economy, free from foreign, especially Western, influence. A national intelligence estimate in September 1965 warned that if the efforts of the mass-based PKI to energize and unite the Indonesian nation, succeeded. Indonesia would provide a powerful example for the underdeveloped world and hence a credit to communism and a setback for Western prestige. That threat was overcome a few weeks later by a mass slaughter in Indonesia and then the installation of the Suharto dictatorship. From the 1950s, fear of independence and excessive democracy permitting a popular party of the poor to participate in the electoral arena, had been driving factors in Washington's exercises of subversion and violence, much as in Latin America. Cuba's crimes became still more immense in 1975 as it extended its reach to Africa, serving as the instrument of Russia's crusade to dominate the world, Washington proclaimed. If Soviet neocolonialism succeeds, in Angola, UN Ambassador Daniel Patrick Moynihan thundered, the world will not be the same in the aftermath. Europe's oil routes will be under Soviet control as will the strategic South Atlantic, with the next target on the Kremlin's list being Brazil. The theme is again familiar, with changes in the cast of characters. Washington's fury was roused by another Cuban act of successful defiance. When a U.S.-backed South African invasion came close to conquering newly independent Angola, Cuba sent troops on its own initiative, scarcely even notifying Russia, and beat back the invaders. The South African press warned of the blows to South African pride and the boost to African nationalism which has seen South Africa forced to retreat by black Cuban soldiers. South Africa's major black newspaper wrote that, Black Africa is riding the crest of a wave generated by the Cuban success in Angola, and, tasting the heady wine of the possibility of realizing the dream of total liberation. The defense of Angola was one of Cuba's most significant contributions to the liberation of Africa. How remarkable these contributions were was unknown before Glygesis's groundbreaking work appeared, telling the story of a small country's vision of defying a big power's oppression, and, thanks to extraordinary individual heroism and self-sacrifice, changing a continent. Glygesis observes that, Kissinger did his best to smash the one movement that represented any hope for the future of Angola, the MPLA. And though the MPLA bears a grave responsibility for its country's plight in later years, it was the relentless hostility of the United States that forced it into an unhealthy dependence on the Soviet bloc and encouraged South Africa to launch devastating military raids in the 1980s. The many campaigns of international terrorism and economic warfare to overcome successful defiance and left-wing excesses adopting the philosophy of the new nationalism and perhaps even influenced by liberation theology, barely sampled here, are considered insignificant, or perhaps obviously legitimate, as are their bitter consequences. Accordingly, they scarcely enter the enormous current literature and public discussion of international terrorism, and Washington's supposedly new doctrine of regime change. At worst they can be dismissed with comforting euphemisms. An occasional casual reference tells us that nothing happened in Cuba beyond the destabilization campaign known as Operation Mongoose. And fortunately, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Leftist terrorism has all but dried up.
North Korea and Cuba are no longer as busy promoting disorder as they once were. Cuba is listed prominently in scholarly work on terrorism, but typically as a suspect in the crime, not a victim. Reagan-Bush international terrorism in Nicaragua and elsewhere does not exist, or is at worst traceable to inattention or some other understandable departure from the mission assigned by Providence, to the leaders of uh, the idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity. And the Persistence of standard operating procedures after the Cold War also did not occur or doesn't matter. The overriding principle prevails, misdeeds are performed by others, we are culpable only for inadvertent error or oversight. It is of the utmost significance for the future that in a world-dominant power even the worst crimes are easily effaced. The wars in Indochina are a remarkable example. After years of brutal destruction, much of the U.S. population had come to oppose the wars on principled grounds. Among educated elites, however, objections were typically on narrow grounds of cost and failure. We may concede that there were some flaws in our generally praiseworthy effort, notably my lie. When Americans look back with sadness and even shame at the Vietnam War it is horrors like the My Lai Massacre they have in mind, Jean Bethke Elshton writes, the only Vietnam example mentioned in her furious denunciation of the crimes of others. My Lai is convenient because the massacre can be blamed on half-educated GIs trying to survive awful conditions in the field, unlike, say, Operation Wheeler Wallowa to which my lie was a minor footnote, one of the many post-Tet mass murder operations planned by respectable people just like us, so that we need feel no shame, even a sadness, over these huge crimes. Cuba was added to the official list of terrorist states in 1982, replacing Iraq, which was removed so as to make Saddam Hussein eligible for U.S. aid. International Terrorism and Regime Change Nicaragua. It is instructive to look at another international terrorist campaign to overcome successful defiance, the terrorist war against Nicaragua. The case is particularly illuminating because of the scale of the terrorist campaigns aimed at regime change, the role of the current Washington leadership in executing them, and the way they were cast when in progress and reshaped in retrospect within the intellectual culture. The case has further significance because it is so uncontroversial, in the light of the judgments of the highest international authorities, uncontroversial, that is, among those who have a minimal commitment to human rights and international law. There is a simple way to estimate the size of that category, determine how often these elementary matters are discussed, even mentioned, in respectable circles in the West most dramatically after the War on Terror, was redeclared on 9 to 11. From that exercise alone one can draw some conclusions about the future, not very optimistic ones. The attack against Nicaragua was one of the highest priorities of the War on Terror launched as the Reagan administration came into office in 1981, targeting primarily state-sponsored terrorism. Nicaragua was an unusually dangerous agent of the plague because it was so close to home, a cancer, right here in our land mass, openly renewing the goals of Hitler's main camp, Secretary of State George Shultz declared to Congress. Nicaragua was armed by the Soviet Union, which had implanted there, a privileged sanctuary for terrorists and subversives just two days driving time from Harlingen, Texas, the president warned, a dagger pointed at the heart of Texas, to paraphrase an illustrious predecessor. This second Cuba would become a launching pad for revolution up and down, first of all, Latin America, then who knows where? Nicaraguan communists have threatened to carry their revolution into the United States itself. Soon we may see Soviet military bases on America's doorstep, a strategic disaster. Despite the immense odds he faced, 
the president bravely told reporters, I refuse to give up. I remember a man named Winston Churchill who said, never give in. Never, never, never. So we won't. Reagan declared a national emergency because, the policies and the actions of the government of Nicaragua constitute an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. Explaining the bombing of Libya in 1986, Reagan announced that the mad dog Gaddafi was sending arms and advisors to Nicaragua to bring his war home to the United States, part of his campaign, to expel America from the world. Particularly ominous was Nicaragua's revolution without borders, regularly brandished though it had immediately been exposed as a fraud. The source was a speech by Sandinista leader Tomas Borga explaining that Nicaragua hoped to develop successfully and provide a model for others who would have to follow their own paths. The speech was transmuted by Reaganite public diplomacy into a design for world conquest and faithfully relayed by the media. Even more interesting than the antics of a political leadership seeking to set new records for absurdity and deceit are the actual contents of the document subjected to State Department manipulation. Borga's words probably did strike terror in the hearts of Reagan's planners. They understood very well that the real threat is successful development that might infect others, renewing the danger of Guatemala's crushed experiment with democracy and social reform, Cuba's successful defiance, and many other examples, back to the days when the American Revolution terrified the Tsar and Metternich. The threat had to be recast in terms of aggression and terror for the purposes of public diplomacy. Pursuing that vocation, Secretary of State Schultz warned that terrorism is a war against ordinary citizens. As he spoke, U.S. planes were bombing Libya, killing dozens of ordinary citizens. The bombing was the first terrorist attack in history scheduled for primetime TV, exactly when all major networks opened their evening news, no small technical feat given the logistical difficulties. Schultz warned particularly of the Nicaraguan cancer, announcing that we must cut it out. And not by gentle means, negotiations are a euphemism for capitulation if the shadow of power is not cast across the bargaining table, Schultz orated, condemning those who advocate utopian, legalistic means like outside mediation, the United Nations, and the World Court, while ignoring the power element of the equation. Washington forcefully blocked such utopian means, beginning with the efforts of Central American presidents to bring a negotiated peace to the region in the early 1980s. Washington proceeded to cut the cancer out by violence and, not surprisingly considering the array of forces, with great success. The leading academic historian of Nicaragua, Thomas Walker, points out that after a few years, Washington's terrorist war had reversed the considerable economic growth and social progress that followed the overthrow of the U.S.-backed Somoza dictatorship, driving the highly vulnerable economy to disaster so that the country achieved the unenviable status of being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere by the time the administration had achieved its goals. One component of the triumph, Walker continues, was a death toll that would be comparable to 2.25 million dead in the U.S., relative to population. Reagan State Department official and historian Thomas Carruthers observes that for Nicaragua, the toll, in per capita terms was significantly higher than the number of U.S. persons killed in the U.S. Civil War, and all the wars of the 20th century combined. Destruction of Nicaragua was a task of no slight importance. The country's progress during the early 1980s was lauded by the World Bank and other international agencies as remarkable and as laying a solid foundation for long-term socioeconomic development, Inter-American Development Bank. In the health sector, 
the country enjoyed one of the most dramatic improvements in child survival in the developing world, UNICEF, 1986. The real cancer feared by the Reaganites was thus serious, Nicaragua's a remarkable transformation could have metastasized to a revolution without borders, in the sense of the speech that was reshaped for propaganda purposes. It was therefore only logical, from Washington's point of view, to eradicate the virus before it could infect others, who must in turn be inoculated by terror and repression. Like Cuba, Nicaragua did not respond to the terrorist attack with bombings in the U.S., efforts to assassinate the political leadership, and other such measures, which, we are solemnly informed, meet the highest standards when conducted by our leaders. Rather, it approached the World Court for relief. Its legal team was led by the distinguished Harvard University law professor Abram Chase. Expecting that the U.S. would abide by a court decision, the team prepared a very narrow case, restricted to terrorist acts that required scarcely any argument, because they were conceded. Mining of Nicaraguan harbors, in particular. In 1986, the court found in Nicaragua's favor, dismissing U.S. government claims and condemning Washington for unlawful use of force, international terrorism, in lay terms. The court ruling went beyond Nicaragua's narrow charge. Reiterating more forcefully earlier decisions, the court ruled any form of intervention, prohibited, if it interferes with the sovereign right of a choice of a political, economic, social and cultural system, and the formulation of policy, intervention is wrongful when it uses methods of coercion in regard to such choices. The judgment applies to many other cases. The court also defined humanitarian aid explicitly, ruling all U.S. aid to the Contras strictly military, hence illegal. U.S. economic warfare was also ruled in violation of valid treaties, therefore unlawful. The decision had little detectable effect. The World Court was condemned as a hostile forum by the editors of the New York Times, and therefore irrelevant, like the UN. Legal authorities noted for their defense of world order dismissed the ruling on grounds that America needs the freedom to defend freedom. Thomas Frank, as it was doing in devastating Nicaragua and much of the rest of Central America. Others condemned the court because of its close ties to the Soviet Union, Robert Lycan, Washington Post, a claim not worthy of refutation. Subsequent aid to the Contras was uniformly described as a humanitarian, in violation of the explicit court ruling. Congress immediately approved an additional $100 million to escalate what the court had condemned as the unlawful use of force. Washington continued to undermine utopian, legalistic means until it finally achieved its ends by violence. The World Court further ordered the U.S. to pay indemnities, and Nicaragua sought to estimate the costs under international supervision. Estimates were in the $17 billion to $18 billion range. The call for reparations was of course dismissed as ridiculous, though just to make sure, after the U.S. regained control, the Nicaraguan government was heavily pressured to abandon the claims for reparations mandated by the court. Interestingly, the figure of $17 billion is the amount that Iraq has paid to people and companies in compensation for its invasion of Kuwait. The numbers killed in the Iraqi conquest of Kuwait appear to be on the order of the U.S. invasion of Panama a few months earlier, hundreds or thousands, according to various estimates, a fraction of the deaths in Nicaragua and perhaps 5% of those killed in the U.S.-backed Israeli invasion of Lebanon, in 1982. There is, of course, no thought of compensation in such cases. Another relevant comparison in terms of compensation is Vietnam. Here attitudes vary as usual from doves to hawks.
At the dovish extreme, President Carter assured Americans that we owe Vietnam no debt and have no responsibility to render it any assistance because the destruction was mutual. Others thought we should not be so soft-hearted. Taking a moderate view, neither hawk nor dove, President Bush I announced that it was a bitter conflict, but Hanoi knows today that we seek only answers without the threat of retribution for the past. The crimes the Vietnamese committed against us can never be forgotten, but we can begin writing the last chapter of the Vietnam War if they dedicate themselves with sufficient zeal to the MIAs. The sole moral issue that remains after an invasion that left millions dead and three countries in utter ruins, with unknown numbers still dying from unexploded ordnance and the massive chemical warfare attack against the South, the North was spared this particular horror. The adjacent front-page story in the New York Times reports Japan's failure, once again, to unambiguously accept the blame for its wartime aggression. Given that the invaders were the victims, the Vietnamese are responsible for reparations. Vietnam was therefore compelled to pay to the U.S. the huge debt incurred by the Saigon government that the U.S. had installed as its local agent for its wars in Indochina, which targeted primarily South Vietnam. Clinton, however, magnanimously advocated a plan to allow Vietnam to use some portion of its debt to the U.S. for educational purposes. Clinton's plan was modeled on a 1908 program that returned to China a portion of the indemnity it was forced to pay for rebelling against its foreign masters, the Boxer Rebellion. There are earlier precedents. Haiti's liberation from French rule in 1804 shocked civilized opinion, which feared that the virus of liberation might spread from the first free nation of free men. For obvious reasons, the danger was particularly acute in the U.S., which took the lead in isolating the criminal state, relenting only in 1862 when destinations were being sought for freed slaves. Liberia was recognized in the same year in punishment. For the crime of liberation, Haiti was compelled to pay France a huge indemnity in 1825, which guaranteed French domination and had a catastrophic effect on the society that France had devastated in the War of Liberation, in its richest colony. Half a century before France's punishment of Haiti for its successful defiance, George Washington set forth in 1779 on the conquest of the advanced Iroquois civilization. His goal was to extirpate them from the country, he wrote to Lafayette on the 4th of July, and to expand American boundaries westward toward the Mississippi, conquest of Canada was barred by British force. The Utown destroyer, as Washington was known to the indigenous population, completed his mission successfully. The Iroquois were then informed that they would have to provide compensation for their treacherous resistance to their liberators. Another Clinton, then governor of New York, informed the defeated tribes that, considering our losses, the debts we have incurred, and our former friendship, it is reasonable that you make to us a cession of your lands as will aid us in repairing and discharging the same. Having little choice, the Iroquois ceded their territory, only to discover that New York State proceeded at once to violate its solemn treaties and the prohibitions of the Articles of Confederation, and to take most of the rest through threats, deception, and guile. A young American soldier later wrote home that, I really feel guilty as I applied the torch to huts that were homes of content until we ravagers came spreading desolation everywhere, but perhaps in a good cause. Our mission here is ostensibly to destroy but may it not transpire that we pillagers are carelessly sowing the seeds of empire? Following the U.S. rejection of the world court orders, Nicaragua, still issuing violent retaliation or threat of terror, took its case to the Security Council, which endorsed the court's judgment and called on all states to observe international law. The U.S. vetoed the resolution.
Nicaragua then approached the General Assembly, which passed a similar resolution with only the U.S., Israel, and El Salvador opposed, and another the following year with only the U.S. and Israel opposed. Little of this was even reported, and the matter has disappeared from history. Washington's reaction to the orders of the World Court and the Security Council was to escalate the terrorist war, while also issuing official orders to its forces to go, after soft targets, and to avoid the Nicaraguan army. State Department spokesperson Charles Redman confirmed and justified the new and more extreme terrorist programs, issuing a statement that would do credit to George Orwell's Ministry of Truth. America's Watch responded, adding that Redman's conception of legitimate target would justify terrorist attacks on Israeli collectives, or on U.S. civilian targets, for that matter. New Republic editor Michael Kinsley criticized human rights organizations for becoming too emotional about State Department justifications for terrorist attacks on soft targets. We should instead adopt a sensible policy that meets the test of cost-benefit analysis, he advised, an analysis of the amount of blood and misery that will be poured in, and the likelihood that democracy will emerge at the other end, democracy, as U.S. elites understand the term, an interpretation illustrated quite clearly in the region. It is taken for granted that they have the right to conduct the analysis and pursue the project if it passes their tests. And it did pass their tests. In 1990, with a, a gun to their heads, as, was clear to many impartial observers, Walker, Nicaraguans succumbed and voted to turn the country over to the U.S.-backed candidate. U.S. elites celebrated the triumph, entranced by the new, romantic age. Commentators across the spectrum of respectable opinion enthusiastically lauded the success of the methods adopted to wreck the economy and prosecute a long and deadly proxy war until the exhausted natives overthrow the unwanted government themselves, with a cost to us that is minimal, leaving the victims with wrecked bridges, sabotaged power stations, and ruined farms and thus providing the U.S. candidate with a winning issue, ending the impoverishment of the people of Nicaragua, time. We are united in joy at this outcome, proud of this victory for U.S. fair play, headlines in the New York Times proclaimed. The official policy of attacking soft targets relied on U.S. control of the skies over Nicaragua and the sophisticated communications equipment provided to the terrorist forces attacking from U.S. bases in Honduras. The Reagan administration tried the technique that was praised by CIA Director Alan Dulles in Guatemala, and recommended for Cuba, pressuring allies to refuse requests for military aid, so that Nicaragua would turn to the Russians for help and could then be portrayed as a tentacle of the Kremlin-sponsored conspiracy, poised to destroy us. The Nicaraguan government did not rise to the bait, however. Reaganite propaganda therefore fabricated lurid tales about Soviet MiGs threatening the U.S. from Nicaraguan bases. That is not surprising. One expects systems of vast power to be committed to lying and deceit. But the reactions are more revealing. Hawks called for the bombing of Nicaragua in punishment for this J. New crime. Doves tended to be more cautious, questioning the reliability of the claims but adding that if they were accurate, then we would have to bomb Nicaragua, because the planes would be capable against the United States. Senator Paul Tsongas. U.S. security would be at risk if the Nicaraguan Air Force obtained some vintage 1950s MiGs to defend its airspace. In contrast, there was no threat to Nicaragua's security when U.S. client forces attack undefended civilian targets, under the guidance of U.S. planes that controlled the country's skies. Another example of illogical illogicality.
that Nicaragua might have the right to protect its airspace from ongoing U.S. terrorist attack is next to inconceivable. The thought was virtually never voiced, which is reasonable, too, given the principle that U.S. actions are defensive by definition so that any reaction to them is aggression, much like the internal aggression of the South Vietnamese in South Vietnam, assaulting the American defenders from the inside, in the rhetoric of Kennedy liberals. With Washington-style democracy and proper economic practice restored, the country sank more deeply into political and socioeconomic ruin while attention lapsed in the U.S. A decade after the U.S. had regained control, half the economically active population had left the country, often the boldest, most capable, most determined, either legally or as illegal migrant workers. Their remittances, estimated at some $800 million annually, are what keep the damper down on uncontrollable social upheaval, the research journal of the Jesuit University reported. It also estimated that, Nicaragua's gross domestic product would have to grow 5% annually for the next 50 years to reattain the productive levels of 1978, before our historic underdevelopment was intensified to the extreme by the U.S. financed war to destroy the revolution, by the wreckage left by subsequent globalization, and by the massive corruption of the post-1990 U.S. backed governments. That issue of the journal appeared just as the U.S. suffered its first international terrorist atrocity on home soil. Another striking illustration of prevailing attitudes toward terrorism is the warning of Bush administration officials, two months later that Nicaragua would be punished if its November 2002 election were to be won by the political forces that had dared to resist U.S. attack, the FSLN, and thus, do not share the values of the world community. Washington, cannot forget that Nicaragua ended up a refuge for violent political extremists, in the 1980s. There is some truth to that, Managua did serve as a refuge for social democratic political leaders, poets and writers, prominent religious figures, human rights activists, and others fleeing the death squads and official security forces of the terrorist states installed and backed by Washington, rather as Paris became a refuge from fascism and Stalinism in the 1930s. We are reminded of the refuge daily by the continuing presence of some members of the FSLN leadership who perpetrated these abominations, the State Department warned Nicaraguan voters. Given their past record, why should we believe their statements that they have changed? We are confident that the Nicaraguan people will reflect on the nature and history of the candidates and choose wisely. Nicaraguans hardly needed the warnings. Their history sufficed to tell them that, should they misbehave by electing the wrong government, as they did in 1984 in an election that the U.S. refused to recognize because it could not control the outcome, and has therefore been excised from history, then Nicaragua will again be considered a state that supports terrorism, with the penalties that ensue, which are not trivial. Citing Washington's cynical warnings, the editors of Envio observed that, it is a safe bet that those who took up arms at a time when, U.S., state terrorism was killing, torturing, forcing disappearances and closing all political spaces will now be reclassified as terrorists. The unimaginable and singular tragedy of September 11 surely felt like the end of the world, in the targeted country, the editors observed. But, Nicaragua experiences the end of the world nearly every day, after the destruction the U.S. government has repeatedly wreaked on this country and its people. The atrocities of 9 to 11 may be denounced as Armageddon, but Nicaraguans recall that their country lived its own Armageddon in excruciating slow motion, under U.S. assault, and is now submerged in its dismal aftermath, having been reduced to the second poorest country in the hemisphere, after Haiti 
vying with Guatemala for the distinction, also enjoying perhaps the world record for concentration of wealth. Among the victors, all of this has been effaced in the classic fashion. Nicaragua and El Salvador are remembered as relative success stories, and precisely the kind of success stories we lack in the Middle East, to be remedied by the new crusade for democratization. One would be hard put to find a phrase within mainstream commentary suggesting that the record of international terrorism of current Bush administration officials might have some bearing on the war on terror they redeclared on 9-11. Among the leading figures of the redeclared war is John Negroponte, who ran the embassy in Honduras that was the main base for the terrorist attacks on Nicaragua. He was duly chosen to oversee the diplomatic component of the current phase of the war on terror at the United Nations. Its military component is run by Donald Rumsfeld, who was Reagan's special envoy to the Middle East during the period of the worst terror there and was also delegated to establish firmer relations with Saddam Hussein. The Central American War on Terror was supervised by Elliot Abrams. After pleading guilty to misdemeanor counts in the Iran-Contra affair, Abrams received a Christmas Eve pardon from President Bush I in 1992, and was appointed by Bush II to lead the National Security Council's Office for Near East and North African Affairs the senior director job, that, oversees Arab-Israeli relations and U.S. efforts to promote peace in the troubled region, a phrase drawn from Orwell, in light of the record. Abrams is joined by Otto Reich, who was charged with running an illegal covert domestic propaganda campaign against Nicaragua, appointed temporary assistant secretary for Latin American affairs under Bush II then-designated Special Envoy for Western Hemisphere Affairs. To replace Reich as Assistant Secretary, the administration nominated Roger Noriega, who served in the State Department during the Reagan administration, helping forge fiercely anti-communist policies toward Latin America, in translation, terrorist atrocities. Secretary of State Powell, now cast as administration moderate, served as national security adviser during the final stage of the terror, atrocities, and undermining of diplomacy in the 1980s in Central America, and the support for the apartheid regime in South Africa. His predecessor, John Poindexter, was in charge of the Iran-Contra crimes and was convicted in 1990 of five felony counts, overturned mostly on technicalities. Bush too placed him in charge of directing the Pentagon's Total Information Awareness Program, under which, the ACLU observes, every American, from the Nebraskan farmer to the Wall Street banker, will find themselves under the accusatory cyber stare of an all-powerful national security apparatus. The rest of the list is mostly similar. Nicaraguans were the lucky ones during the first phase of the War on Terror. They at least had an army to defend them against state-supported terrorism. In neighboring states the terrorists were the security forces. El Salvador became the leading recipient of U.S. military aid and training, Israel-Egypt aside, by the mid-1980s, as atrocities were peaking. Congress imposed human rights conditions on aid to Guatemala compelling the Reaganites to resort to their international terror network to take over the task, including Argentine neo-Nazis, until they were overthrown at home, Israel, Taiwan, and others experienced in counter-terror. The torture and destruction of the civilian population were consequently much worse. The editors of Envio add that in December 1989, the government of George Bush Sr. ordered the invasion of Panama, a military operation that bombed civilian neighborhoods and killed thousands of Panamanians just to flush out a single man, Manuel Noriega. Was that not state terrorism? A fair question, 
though much stronger terms are used when those who lack the power to control history carry out such actions. Though it disappeared by the victors in routine fashion, the crimes are not forgotten by the victims. Panamanians, too, while condemning the 9 to 11 attacks, recalled the death of perhaps thousands of poor people in the course of Operation Just Cause, undertaken to kidnap a disobedient thug who was sentenced to life imprisonment in Florida for crimes mostly committed while he was on the CIA payroll. One journalist remarked a how much alike, the victims of 9 to 11, are to the boys and girls, to the mothers and the grandfathers and the little old grandmothers, all of them also innocent. When the terror was called just cause and the terrorist called liberator. Perhaps such memories help account for the remarkably low level of international support for the U.S. bombing of Afghanistan, in Latin America, where there is the longest experience of U.S. violence, support was least, scarcely detectable. Latin Americans hardly have to be reminded by Carlos Salinas, former director of government relations for Amnesty International, that they know better than perhaps most people that the U.S. government is one of the biggest sponsors of terrorism. It is easy to dismiss the world as irrelevant or consumed by paranoid anti-Americanism, but perhaps not wise. Chapter 5 The Iraq Connection After eight years, more reactionary sectors of the Reagan-Bush-I administrations regained political power in the contested 2000 election. They recognized that the 9 to 11 atrocities provided them with an opportunity to pursue long-standing goals, with even greater intensity, closely following the script of their earlier tenure in office. The Script, International For George Bush the Younger PR specialists and speechwriters have constructed the image of a simple man with a direct line to heaven, who relies on his gut instincts as he strides forward to rid the world of evildoers while contemplating his visions and dreams. A caricature of ancient epics and children's tales, with an admixture of cowboy fiction. The first time around, the imagery constructed for the leader was not very different and the rhetoric no less fevered. All states must band together to combat the evil scourge of terrorism, Reagan. Particularly state-backed international terrorism, a plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself, in a return to barbarism in the modern age, George Schultz. Important questions should have arisen at once. What constitutes terrorism? How does it differ from aggression or resistance? The operative answers are revealing, but the questions never entered the arena of public discussion. A convenient definition was adopted, terrorism is what our leaders declare it to be. Period. The practice continues as the war is redeclared. In the 1980s the two main foci of the war on terror were Central America and the Mideast slash Mediterranean region. In Central America, as discussed, the war on terror instantly became a barbaric terrorist war, hailed as a grand success and discarded from history. In the Middle East, as we shall see, the commanders in Washington and their local associates were again responsible for crimes far exceeding anything charged to their official enemies. The facts are particularly Noteworthy because the retail terror they were opposing was inflated by their propaganda systems to become the lead story of the year. By the mid-1980s, an impressive achievement. Turning elsewhere, during the Reagan years Washington's South African ally had primary responsibility for more than 1.5 million dead and $60 billion in damage in the newly liberated Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique. A UNICEF study estimated the death toll of infants and young children in these two countries at 850,000, 150,000 in 1988 alone, reversing gains of the early post-independence years primarily through the weapon of mass terrorism.
that is putting aside South Africa's practices within its own borders, where it was defending civilization against the onslaughts of Nelson Mandela's African National Congress, one of the more notorious terrorist groups, according to a 1988 Pentagon report. Meanwhile the Reaganites evaded sanctions, increased trade, and provided valuable diplomatic support for South Africa. One of the endeavors of the current incumbents has become well known, the success of the CIA and its associates during the 1980s in recruiting radical Islamists and organizing them into a military and terrorist force. The goal, according to Carter's national security adviser, Zbigniew Brzezinski, was to draw the Russians into the Afghan trap initially by secret operations that would induce them to invade Afghanistan. The Carter-Brzezinski reaction to the subsequent invasion was based on a complete misinterpretation of the Russian decision to intervene, according to the very knowledgeable analyst Raymond Garthoff. The Russian decision was undertaken reluctantly and with narrow and defensive objectives, as is now clearly established in the Soviet archives, he writes. For the Reaganites, who took over a year later, the single aim, he continues, was, bleeding the Russians and pillorying the Soviets in world opinion. The immediate result was a war that devastated Afghanistan, with even worse consequences after the Russians withdrew and Reagan's jihadis took over. The long-term result was two decades of terror and civil war. In the 1980s there was threat of worse, as, CIA-backed incursions of Afghan guerrillas and saboteurs into Soviet territory nearly provoked a major Soviet-Pakistani, if not Soviet-American war, with unforeseeable consequences. After the Russians withdrew, the terror organizations recruited, armed, and trained by the U.S. and its allies, among them Al-Qaeda and similar jihadis, turned their attention elsewhere, inflaming the India-Pakistan conflict with an unprecedented terrorist offensive in India in March 1993, and repeatedly bringing the region to the brink of nuclear war in later years as the flames spread. A month earlier, related groups had come close to blowing up the World Trade Center, following a formula taught in CIA manuals. The planning was traced to followers of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, who had been helped to enter the U.S. and was protected within the country by the CIA. Other consequences around the world need not be reviewed. Also at least partially familiar is the long-standing support of the present incumbents for Saddam Hussein, often attributed to obsession with Iran. That policy continued without change after Iran's capitulation in the Iran-Iraq War, because of our duty to support U.S. exporters, the State Department explained in early 1990, adding the usual boilerplate about how aiding Saddam would improve human rights, regional stability, and peace. In October 1989, long after the war with Iran was over and more than a year after Saddam's gassing of the Kurds, President Bush I issued a national security directive declaring that normal relations between the United States and Iraq would serve our longer-term interests and promote stability in both the Gulf and the Middle East. He took the occasion of the invasion of Panama shortly after to lift a ban on loans to Iraq. The U.S. offered subsidized food supplies that Saddam's regime badly needed after its destruction of Kurdish agricultural production, along with advanced technology and biological agents adaptable to WMD. The warmth of the relations was indicated when a delegation of senators, led by Majority Leader and future Republican presidential candidate Bob Dole, visited Saddam in April 1990. They conveyed President Bush's greetings and assured Saddam that his problems did not lie with the U.S. government but with the haughty and pampered press. Senator Alan Simpson advised Saddam to invite them to come here and see for themselves to overcome their misconceptions.
Dole assured Saddam that a commentator on Voice of America who had been critical of him had been removed. Saddam was not the only monster who won the acclaim of the current incumbents. Among others were Ferdinand Marcos, Baby Doc Duvalier, and Nikolai Soescu, all were overthrown from within, despite strong U.S. support until their fate was sealed. Other favorites included Indonesia's President Suharto, who competed with Saddam in barbarism. The first head of state honored with a visit to Bush the Elder's White House was Mobutu Sisi Siko of Zaire, another high-ranking killer, torturer, and plunderer. The South Korean dictators also received Washington's strong support until U.S.-backed military rule was finally overthrown, in 1987 by popular movements. Even minor thugs could be assured of a warm welcome as long as they were performing their function. Secretary of State Schultz was so enamored of Manuel Noriega that he flew to Panama to congratulate him after he had stolen an election by fraud and violence, praising the gangster for initiating the process of democracy. Later Noriega lost his usefulness in the Contra War and other enterprises, and was transferred to the category of evil, although, like Saddam, his worst crimes were behind him. He then became the target of invasion and kidnapping from the Vatican Embassy in Operation Just Cause, with consequences already mentioned. Some of these rulers easily matched Saddam in internal terror. So Escu provides an instructive case. Under his rule, the population lived in terror of his dread security forces, renowned for their torture and barbarism. A week after he was overthrown in an unanticipated popular revolt in December 1989, the Washington Post described how he had destroy, ed, the economic, intellectual, and artistic fabric of Romania, compiling a ghastly record in human rights. President Bush too spoke the truth when he made a Kennedy-esque appearance at Liberation Square in Bucharest, praising the nation that just 12 years ago deposed its own iron-fisted ruler, Nicolae Soescu. It was a dramatic occasion, with a cold rain pelting his black raincoat and uncovered head, Bush said. You know the difference between good and evil, because you have seen evil's face. The people of Romania understand that aggressive dictators cannot be appeased or ignored. They must always be opposed. The president and his admirers failed to mention just how his father and his own colleagues had honored the prescription that iron-fisted tyrants like So Escu must always be opposed. The answer turns out to be a familiar one, by supporting them. We confront evil's face by lending it a willing hand, at least if there is something to gain. The immediate post-revolution Washington Post article just cited was correct in reporting that, it is nice that President Bush I, has offered to establish diplomatic relations with, Romania's, hastily organized Council of National Salvation, but that does not absolve the West for its role in helping to maintain this tyrant in recent years, a message that seems to have gone the way of other unacceptable insights into the real world. In 1983, Vice President Bush expressed his admiration for So Escu's political and economic progress and respect for human rights. Two years later Reagan's ambassador resigned because of Washington's objections to his concern for human rights. Shortly after, Secretary of State Schultz praised Romania as among the good communists, rewarding So Escu with a visit and economic favors. So matters continued until the tyrant was overthrown, by Romanians as in the case of other killers and torturers in the Reagan-Bush entourage. As soon as its favorite, good communist, was eliminated, Washington announced that a, a terrible burden, had been lifted from Romania, while at the same time lifting its ban on loans to Saddam Hussein in order to achieve the, goal of increasing U.S. exports and put us in a better position to deal with Iraq regarding its human rights record.
the State Department explained with a straight face. As always, the U.S. leadership can confidently take credit for the overthrow of the tyrants it supported until the very end. Saddam Hussein has joined the pantheon of failed brutal dictators whom the U.S. has deposed, Donald Rumsfeld proudly announced, including So Esku in the pantheon. On the same day as Rumsfeld's declaration, Paul Wolfowitz explained that his love of democracy was honed. During his formative years in the Reagan administration, when he was the State Department's chief Asia hand, praising the monstrous Suharto and supporting the brutal and corrupt Marcos, whose fall, he now claims, shows that democracy needs the prodding of the U.S. 10, which backed Marcos until he could no longer be sustained in the face of popular opposition joined even by the business classes and the army. The other examples are equally convincing. As the rogues' gallery of past friends fades into oblivion, new favorites take their place. Among them the Central Asian dictators, Uzbekistan's Islam Karimov, Turkmenistan's Saparmurat Niyazov, and others, who were becoming even more brutal and repressive as they were welcomed as participants in the redeclared War on Terror also reinforcing the U.S. position in a region of considerable material wealth and strategic significance. Or, in another corner of the world rich in coveted oil, there is Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, who ranks high in the competition among bloody tyrants and was duly received with full honors by President Bush, in September 2002, shortly before he was re-elected to a seven-year term with 97% of the vote. An enthusiastic welcome has also been extended to Algeria, which had already been singled out for praise by Clinton's State Department for its achievements in combating terror, meaning its horrendous record of state terrorist atrocities. Bush carried support for terror and torture to new extremes offering military aid and other assistance to the Algerian government. Washington has much to learn from Algeria on ways to fight terrorism, we learn from William Burns, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East. Mr. Burns is right, Robert Fisk comments. America has much to learn from the Algerians including the barbaric techniques of torture that Fisk and a few other journalists have been exposing for years and that are now confirmed by Algerian army defectors in London and Paris. Up to 200,000 Algerians have been slaughtered in the 11 years since the military cancelled that country's first democratic elections because an Islamist party won, Lisa Marlowe writes. If Algeria is the U.S. model for countering Islamic fundamentalism, heaven help us all. The sample above illustrates the consistency of the foreign policy record of the current incumbents. The domestic record displays a similar consistency. The script, domestic. The Reagan years saw a continuation of the relatively poor economic performance of the 1970s. Growth overwhelmingly benefited the very rich, unlike the golden age of the 50s and 60s, when it was evenly spread across the population. During the Reagan-Bush years real wages stagnated or declined along with benefits, working hours increased, and employers were given free reign to ignore protection for labor organizing. The policies were, naturally, unpopular. As the Bush I administration reached its final days, Reagan was ranked alongside Nixon as the least popular living ex-president. It is not easy, under such conditions, to maintain political power. Only one good method is known, inspire fear. That tactic was employed throughout the Reagan-Bush years, as the leadership conjured up one devil after another to frighten the populace into obedience. The threats to Americans during the first war on terror were immense. By November 1981, Libyan hit men were roaming the streets of Washington to assassinate the president, who courageously faced down the scoundrel Gaddafi.
From the first moment, the administration recognized Libya to be a defenseless punching bag, and therefore set up confrontations in which many Libyans could be killed, hoping for a Libyan response that could be exploited to induce fear. Before Americans could breathe a sigh of relief over the president's lucky escape from the Libyan hit men, Gaddafi was on the march again, this time invading Sudan across 600 miles of desert, with the air forces of the U.S. and its allies standing by helplessly. Gaddafi also allegedly concocted a plot to overthrow the government of Sudan so subtle that Sudanese and Egyptian intelligence knew nothing about it as discovered by the few U.S. reporters who took the trouble to investigate. The subsequent U.S. show of force enabled Secretary of State Schultz to announce that Gaddafi is back in his box where he belongs because Reagan acted quickly and decisively, demonstrating the strength of the cowboy that so entranced worshipful intellectuals, Paul Johnson, in this case. The episode was quickly relegated to oblivion once its purposes had been served. Just as the early Libyan threats subsided, another even more dangerous one appeared, an air base in Grenada that the Russians could use to bomb us. Fortunately, our leader came to the rescue in the nick of time. After turning down offers for peaceful settlement on U.S. terms, Washington landed 6,000 elite forces who were able to overcome the resistance of a few dozen lightly armed, middle-aged Cuban construction workers, and we were at last a standing tall, the gallant cowboy in the White House proclaimed. But the threats were not over. Soon Nicaraguans were looming on the horizon, only two days driving time from Harlingen, Texas, waving their copies of Main Camp. Fortunately, the commander-in-chief, recalling Churchill's stand against the Nazis, refused to surrender and was able to fend off the threatening hordes, even though they were being supplied by Gaddafi in his campaign to expel America from the world. As the White House sought to mobilize congressional support for an intensified attack on Nicaragua in 1986, the Libyan threat was conjured up again with deadly U.S. provocations in the Gulf of Sidra followed by the bombing of Libya on primetime TV, killing dozens, on no credible pretext. The official stance was that Article 51 of the Union Charter accords us the right to use violence, in self-defense against future attack. That was perhaps the first explicit formulation of the doctrine of a preventive war, and the end of any hopes of a world of order and law, if taken at all seriously and it was. New York Times legal analyst Anthony Lewis praised the Reagan administration for relying on a legal argument that violence against the perpetrators of repeated violence is justified as an act of self-defense. Imagine the consequences if others were powerful enough to adopt the Reagan-Lewis doctrine. So matters continued through the decade. The European tourist industry went into periodic decline, as Americans were too frightened to travel to European cities because they might be attacked by crazed Arabs or other demons. Grave threats were concocted at home as well. Crime in the U.S. is not very different from other industrial countries. Fear of crime, however, is much higher. The same is true of drugs a problem in other societies, an imminent danger to our very existence in the U.S. It is easy for political leaders to use the media to whip up fear of these and other menaces. Campaigns are mounted periodically, when required by domestic political needs. Bush eyes racist Willie Horton escapade in the 1988 election campaign is a famous example. The September 1989 redeclaration of the drug war was another striking illustration. In the face of substantial evidence to the contrary, the administration dramatically proclaimed that Hispanic narco-traffickers were a menace to our society. Officials could be confident that the tactic would succeed, as explained by journalist and editor Hodding Carter.
former Assistant Secretary of State in the Carter administration. It's a lead pipe cinch, he wrote, that the mass media in America have an overwhelming tendency to jump up and down and bark in concert whenever the White House, any White House, snaps its fingers. The campaign was a grand success, apart from affecting drug use. Fear of drugs instantly shot to the lead of public concerns. The stage was set for escalating the campaign to remove superfluous people from city streets to the new prisons that were rapidly being built, and to go on to Operation Just Cause, the glorious invasion of Panama on grounds of Noriega's involvement with drug trafficking, among other reasons. At the same time, the Bush administration was threatening Thailand with severe sanctions if it placed barriers on import of a far more lethal U.S.-produced substance, tobacco. But all this passed in silence. In the case of Panama, too, there was a knockdown legal argument for invasion. UN Ambassador Thomas Pickering instructed the Security Council that Article 51 of the Union Charter provides for the use of armed force to defend a country, to defend our interests and our people, and to prevent its territory from being used to smuggle drugs into the U.S., in this case by reinstating the white elite of bankers and businessmen, many of whom were themselves suspected of narco-trafficking and money laundering and who soon lived up to their reputation, U.S. government agencies reported. Throughout, the legal arguments keep to a principle enunciated by the distinguished Israeli statesman Abba Eben, in determining the legal basis for some intended action one might work backward from the action one wished to take to find a legal justification. The script has been followed fairly closely as much the same elements gained a hold on political power in the 2000 election. In 1981 they had combined a vast increase in military spending with tax cuts, calculating that growing hysteria over the ensuing deficit would create powerful pressures to cut federal, social, spending, and thus, perhaps, enable the administration to accomplish its goal of rolling back the New Deal. Bush too followed the pattern with tax cuts overwhelmingly benefiting the very rich, and the biggest surge in federal spending in 20 years, largely military, hence indirectly high-tech industry. Government deficits require fiscal discipline, which translates into cutbacks for services for the general population. The administration's own economists estimate the bills that the government will be unable to pay at $44 trillion. Their study was to be included in the annual budget report published in February 2003 but was removed, perhaps because it forecast that closing the gap would require a huge tax increase and Bush was trying to ram through another tax reduction, again benefiting mainly the rich. President Bush is working overtime to deepen our fiscal trap, economists Lawrence Kotlikoff and Jeffrey Sachs observe, reporting the enormous anticipated fiscal gap. Among the results, they contend, will be massive cuts in future Social Security and Medicare benefits. White House spokesperson Ari Fleischer agreed with the $44 trillion estimate and implicitly conceded the accuracy of the analysis as well. There is no question that Social Security and Medicare are going to present future generations with a crushing debt burden unless policymakers work seriously to reform those programs, which does not mean funding them by progressive taxation. The problem is deepened by the serious financial crisis of states and cities. The editors of the State Financial Times are only stating the obvious, economist Paul Krugman comments, when they write that the more extreme Republicans, with their hands on the controls seem to want a fiscal train wreck that offers the tantalizing prospect of forcing cuts on social programs through the back door. Slated for demolition, Krugman contends, are Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security.
but the same may be true for the whole range of programs of the past century that were developed to protect the population from the ravages of private power. Eliminating social programs has goals that go well beyond concentration of wealth and power. Social security, public schools, and other such deviations from the right way that U.S. military power is to impose on the world, as frankly declared, are based on evil doctrines, among them the pernicious belief that we should care, as a community, whether the disabled widow on the other side of town can make it through the day, or the child next door should have a chance for a decent future. These evil doctrines derive from the principle of sympathy that was taken to be the core of human nature by Adam Smith and David Hume, a principle that must be driven from the mind. Privatization has other benefits. If working people depend on the stock market for their pensions, health care, and other means of survival, they have a stake in undermining their own interests, opposing wage increases, health and safety regulations, and other measures that might cut into profits that flow to the benefactors on whom they must rely, in a manner reminiscent of feudalism. After a surge of presidential popularity following 9 to 11, polls revealed increasing discontent with the social and economic policies of the administration. If there was to be any hope of maintaining political power, the Bush forces were virtually compelled to adopt what Anatole Levin calls the classic modern strategy of an endangered right-wing oligarchy, which is to divert mass discontent into nationalism a strategy which is second nature to them in any event, having worked so well during their first twelve years in office. The strategy was outlined by Karl Rove, the chief political adviser, Republicans must go to the country on the issue of national security in November 2002, because voters trust the Republican Party for protecting America. Similarly, he explained, Bush will have to be portrayed as a wartime leader for the 2004 presidential campaign. As long as domestic issues were dominating news coverage and political battles over the summer, Bush and his Republicans lost ground, the chief international analyst for UPI pointed out. But the imminent threat of Iraq was conjured up just in time, in September 2002. Recognizing its vulnerability on domestic issues, the administration is campaigning to sustain and increase its power on a policy of international adventurism, new radical preemptive military strategies, and a hunger for a politically convenient and perfectly timed confrontation with Iraq. For the midterm electoral campaign, the tactic worked, just. Even though voters who believe that Republicans are more concerned about large corporations than about ordinary Americans, they trust the Republicans on national security. In September, the national security strategy was announced. Manufactured fear provided enough of a popular base for the invasion of Iraq, instituting the new norm of aggressive war at will and afforded the administration enough of a hold on political power so that it could proceed with a harsh and unpopular domestic agenda. Again, the script of the first tenure in power is being followed closely, though now with greater fervor, fewer external constraints, and considerably greater threats to peace. Insignificant Risks the war with Iraq was undertaken with the recognition that it might well lead to proliferation of WMD and terror, risks considered insignificant compared with the prospect of gaining control over Iraq, firmly establishing the norm of preventive war, and strengthening the hold on domestic power. Evidence as to how seriously real security threats ranked on the priority list was provided immediately. After the announcement of the Imperial Grand Strategy on September 17, 2002, the administration at once publicly abandoned an international effort to strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention against Germ Warfare, advising allies that further discussions would have to be delayed for four years.
As noted, in mid-October it was learned that during an earlier episode of Playing with Fire, the world was brought ominously close to nuclear war. Ten days later, on October 23, the UN Disarmament Committee adopted two crucial resolutions. The first called for stronger measures to prevent the militarization of space and thereby to avert a grave danger for international peace and security. The second reaffirmed the 1925 Geneva Protocol, prohibiting the use of poisonous gases and bacteriological methods of warfare. Both passed unanimously, with two abstentions, the U.S. and Israel. U.S. abstention amounts to a veto, typically, a double veto, banning the events from reporting and history. In the mainstream media, there was no mention of these failed attempts by the rest of the world to prevent serious threats to survival. The meager press coverage of the startling revelations at the Havana retrospective in October 2002 had little to say about the highly topical issues of international terrorism and forceful regime change, or about the Iraq connection, which was very much in the minds of the participants. On their way to Havana, they had surely read the letter sent by CIA Director George Tenet to the Senate Intelligence Committee Chair, Senator Bob Graham, reporting that although there was little likelihood that Saddam would initiate a terrorist operation with conventional weapons, or any chemical or biological weapons he might have, the probability would rise to a pretty high, in the event of U.S. attack. The FBI also reported concerns that a war with Iraq could trigger new domestic terrorism risks, as did the head of Homeland Security. The leading international military intelligence journal and allied intelligence agencies drew the same conclusions, adding the further observation that a U.S. attack could globalize anti-American and anti-Western sentiment attacking Iraq would intensify Islamic terrorism not reduce it, a war in Iraq threatens to fuel unrest and create new terrorist threats. European security and police officials are warning their governments, recruiting new young people, to the ever-growing anti-U.S. stand. Concurring, Richard Betts, a specialist on surprise attack and nuclear blackmail, wrote that in the event of a U.S. invasion, Saddam will have no reason to withhold his best parting shot which could be the use of WMD inside the United States, that is, activating networks already in place. The odds may be low, he observed, perhaps as low as what took place on 9 to 11. Those who have any concern for the safety and security of the people of the United States and other likely targets would not, of course, dismiss the odds as negligible. Mainstream experts agreed that an attack by the most powerful military force in history against a defenseless enemy might well stimulate the quest for revenge or deterrence. Prominent international relations scholars have pointed out that potential targets of U.S. adventurism know that the United States can be held at bay only by deterrence, primarily by WMD, Kenneth Waltz. In this way, American policies stimulate the vertical proliferation of nuclear weapons and promote their spreading from one country to another. The same policies stimulate terrorism, unsurprisingly, weak states and disaffected people lash out at the United States as the agent or symbol of their suffering, and if no efforts are made to address their grievances, they are likely to react with the means available to them, including terror. U.S. intelligence added that the deepening economic stagnation caused by Washington's version of globalization was likely to have similar effects. These warnings were not new. It had been recognized for some time that the industrial powers were likely to lose their virtual monopoly of violence, retaining only an enormous preponderance. Well before 9 to 11, technical studies had concluded that a well-planned operation to smuggle WMD into the United States would have at least a 90% probability of success.
This has become America's Achilles heel, a study with that title concluded, reviewing the many options available to terrorists. The Council on Foreign Relations Task Force study adds others. The imminence of the danger was evident after the 1993 attempt to blow up the World Trade Center, which, with better planning, might have killed tens of thousands of people, the WTC building engineers reported. It was also anticipated that an attack on Iraq might stimulate proliferation in more direct ways. Terrorism specialist Daniel Benjamin, no dove, observed that an invasion might cause the greatest proliferation disaster in history. Saddam Hussein had proven himself to be a brutal tyrant, but a rational one. If he had chemical and biological weapons, they were kept under tight control and subjected to a proper chain of command. He would surely not put them in the hands of the Osama bin Ladens of the world, a terrible threat to Saddam himself. But under attack, Iraqi society might collapse, and with it the controls over WMD, which might be offered to the huge market for unconventional weapons, a, a nightmare scenario, from every point of view. Post-war investigation reveals that Benjamin's concerns may have been realized with the looting of nuclear sites. This pre-war establishment critique had a number of important features. First, it echoed concerns in the same circles about the posture of a rogue superpower that much of the world regards as the greatest threat to world peace and the single greatest external threat to their societies. Second, it encompassed an unusually broad spectrum of voices. The comments cited above come from U.S. and world intelligence agencies, the world's leading military journal the January 2003 issues of the two major national foreign policy journals, an unusual publication of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, some of the most respected specialists on international affairs, terrorism, and strategic analysis, and even the Wizards of Davos, who dominate the world's economy. Whatever one thinks of their judgments, it would not be easy to find a historical precedent for such a critique of a planned war, just as there was no precedent at all for popular opposition to a war prior to its being officially launched. Third, though this critique originated in the establishment, it was ignored. The administration made no effort to counter it, indeed hardly seemed to notice it, which makes sense. From a propaganda point of view, the most powerful state in history needs no justification or serious argument for its actions. Declaration of noble intent should suffice. Just as the UN is informed that it can be irrelevant and authorize what we are going to do or suffer the consequences, so the world should be put on notice that the hegemonic power bears no burden of proof for its resort to violence or any other action. It would be a derogation of authority to acknowledge, let alone refute, critical noises, to borrow McGeorge Bundy's derisive phrase. The critics are right that the superpower stance might lead to self-destruction, but such concerns have commonly not been a high priority of leaders. In the present case, the administration was surely aware, even without warnings from respected authorities that its planned war against Iraq and other related actions were likely to increase the risks of proliferation of WMD and terror against the U.S. and its allies. But evidently it assigns low priority to such threats compared with other goals. Furthermore, though planners of course do not welcome the proliferation of WMD and terrorism, they know that they can exploit such developments for their own purposes, both global and domestic. Even the fear they elicit throughout the world is quite acceptable, they are not trying to be loved, but obeyed, and if this is achieved by fear, that is fine, another contribution to maintaining credibility. As for the goals, senior Middle East correspondent and analyst Youssef
Ibrahim was no doubt oversimplifying when he identified them as bolstering the president's popularity for short-term political gain and a turning a friendly Iraq into a private American oil pumping station. But there is good reason to believe that his observations at least point in the right direction. Maintaining a hold on political power and enhancing U.S. control of the world's primary energy sources are major steps toward the twin goals that have been declared with considerable clarity to institutionalize a radical restructuring of domestic society that will roll back the progressive reforms of a century, and to establish an imperial grand strategy of permanent world domination. Compared with such ends, the risks may well seem insignificant. The Wild Men in the Wings Establishment critics and the White House tended to focus on the same issues as the Security Council debates and the inspections, the Iraqi threat, WMD, and the subcategory of terror that enters the canon. None of the debates gave more than a passing nod to democratization, or liberation, or any other issues that lie beyond the potential threat to the U.S. and its allies. There was little discussion, for example, of the possible effects of war on the population of Iraq, except among the wild men in the wings, to borrow the term used by McGeorge Bundy to refer to those who felt that more was involved in the Vietnam War than military success, and its cost to the invaders. As Washington marched resolutely to war against Iraq, the wild men and women were again looking beyond the narrow question of the costs to themselves. With the Iraqi people at the edge of survival after a decade of destructive sanctions, international aid and medical agencies warned that a war might lead to a serious humanitarian catastrophe. Switzerland hosted a meeting of 30 countries to prepare for what might lie ahead. The U.S. alone refused to attend. Participants, including the other four permanent Security Council members, warned of devastating humanitarian consequences of a war. Former Assistant Secretary of Defense Kenneth Bacon, head of the Washington-based Refugees International, predicted that a war will generate huge flows of refugees and a public health crisis. Meanwhile, U.S. plans for humanitarian relief in a post-war Iraq were criticized by international aid agencies as short on detail, woefully lacking in money, and overly controlled by the military. UN officials complained, there is a studied lack of interest, in Washington, in a warning call we are trying to deliver to the people planning for war, about what its consequences might be. Horrifying and brutal as Saddam Hussein's regime was, he nevertheless did direct oil profits to internal development. A tyrant, at the head of a regime that has turned violence into an instrument of state, with a hideous human rights record, he nevertheless had hoisted half the country's population into the middle class, and Arabs the world over. Came to study at Iraqi universities. The 1991 war, involving the purposeful destruction of water, power, and sewage systems, took a terrible toll and the sanctions regime imposed by the U.S. and U.K. drove the country to the level of bare survival. As one illustration, UNICEF's 2003 report on the state of the world's children states that, Iraq's regression over the past decade is by far the most severe of the 193 countries surveyed, with the child death rate, the best single indicator of child welfare increasing from 50 to 133 per 1,000 live births, placing Iraq below every country outside Africa apart from Cambodia and Afghanistan. Two hawkish military analysts observe that economic sanctions may well have been a necessary, sick, cause of the deaths of more people in Iraq than have been slain by all so-called weapons of mass destruction throughout history in the hundreds of thousands according to conservative estimates. No Westerners know Iraq better than Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponeck, the respected UN diplomats who were the chief UN humanitarian coordinators, 
with an international staff of hundreds of investigators traveling daily through the country. Both resigned in protest at what Halliday described as the genocidal character of the U.S.-U.K. sanctions regime. Both reject claims that food and medicine were being withheld by the authorities. Their successor, Tun Myatt, backed their view, describing the Iraqi system as the best distribution system that he had ever seen in his life, as a World Food Program official. The senior UN World Food Program official reported that the WFP had conducted more than a million inspections of the system and uncovered no significant evidence of fraud or favoritism. He added that there was no way we could create something else that would work half as well as the Iraqi system, which is the most efficient in the world, and that the risk of a large-scale humanitarian crisis would increase if anything happened to disrupt it. As Halliday, von Sponeck, and others had pointed out for years, the sanctions devastated the population while strengthening Saddam Hussein and his clique, also increasing the dependency of the Iraqi people on the tyrant for their survival. Von Sponeck, who resigned in 2000, reported that the US and UK systematically tried to prevent him and Halliday from briefing the Security Council, because they didn't want to hear what we had to say about the savagery of the sanctions. The U.S. media apparently agree. Though the expert knowledge of the U.N. coordinators is without parallel, Americans have had to turn elsewhere to hear what they had to say, even at a moment of laser-like fixation on Iraq. Discussion of the effects of the sanctions has been minimal and apologetic, the usual procedure with regard to the crimes of one's own state. Academic researcher Joy Gordon found that even the information that does reach the Security Council is kept from public scrutiny, though she learned enough, as have others, to reveal a shameful record of deliberate cruelty and efforts pursued aggressively throughout the last decade to purposefully minimize the humanitarian goods that enter the country, in the face of enormous human suffering, including massive increases in child mortality and widespread epidemics. The U.S. blocked water tankers from reaching Iraq on grounds so spurious that they were rejected by the U.N. arms experts. This during a time when the major cause of child deaths was lack of access to clean drinking water, and when the country was in the midst of a drought. Washington insisted that vaccines for infant diseases be withheld until it was compelled to back down in the face of vigorous protest, by UNICEF and the World Health Organization, supported by European biological weapons experts who charged that the dual-use claims of the U.S. were flatly impossible. The International Red Cross, drawing on its own intimate familiarity with the country, concluded in 1999 that after a decade of sanctions, the Iraqi economy lies in tatters, and the Oil for Food program, introduced by UN Resolution 986 in 1995, has not halted the collapse of the health system and the deterioration of water supplies, which together pose one of the gravest threats to the health and well-being of the civilian population. Aid agencies can only hope to mitigate some of the worst effects of the sanctions, and cannot nearly cover the overwhelming needs of 22 million people, the ICRC reported. Defenders of the sanctions regime argued that the appalling situation was Saddam's fault, because of his refusal to comply fully with UN resolutions and his construction of palaces and monuments to himself, and so on, funded by money diverted from smuggling and other illegal operations, according to the testimony of UN humanitarian coordinators and the World Food Program. The argument, then, was that we had to punish Saddam for his crimes by crushing his victims and strengthening their torturer. By similar logic, if a criminal hijacks a school bus, we should blow it up and murder the passengers, but rescue and reward the hijacker, justifying the actions on grounds that it was his fault. Studied lack of interest 
in the likely consequences of war for the population of the country to be invaded is conventional. The same was true when, five days after 9 to 11, Washington demanded that Pakistan eliminate truck convoys that provide much of the food and other supplies to Afghanistan's civilian population, and caused the withdrawal of aid workers along with severe reduction in food supplies, thereby leaving millions of Afghans at grave risk of starvation, risk of what should properly have been termed silent genocide. Estimates of the numbers at grave risk of starvation rose from 5 million before 9 to 11 to 7.5 million a month later. The threat and then reality of bombing elicited sharp protests from aid organizations and warnings of what might ensue, which received only scattered and very partial attention, and little reaction. Perhaps it's worth repeating the obvious. One always hopes that worst-case scenarios will not materialize, and every effort should always be dedicated to that end. But exactly as in the case of Khrushchev's dispatch of missiles to Cuba, which could have led to nuclear war but didn't, it is the range of likely possibilities that determines the evaluation of policy choices that are made, at least for those capable of entertaining elementary moral standards. Trivially, that judgment remains true whatever the outcome. A truism we understand well enough when applied to official enemies but find much harder to apply to ourselves. Democracy and Human Rights As noted, establishment critics restricted their comments regarding the attack on Iraq to the administration arguments. They took to be seriously intended, disarmament, deterrence, and links to terrorism. They scarcely made reference to liberation, democratization of the Middle East, and other matters that would render irrelevant the inspections and indeed everything that took place at the Security Council, or within governmental domains. The reason, perhaps, is that they recognize that lofty rhetoric is the obligatory accompaniment of virtually any resort to force, and therefore carries no information. The rhetoric is doubly hard to take seriously in the light of the display of contempt for democracy that accompanied it, not to speak of the past record and current practices. Critics are also aware that nothing has been heard from the present incumbents, with their alleged concern for Iraqi democracy, to indicate that they have any regrets for their previous support for Saddam Hussein, or others like him, still continuing nor have they shown any signs of contrition for having helped him develop WMD when he really was a serious danger. Nor has the current leadership explained when, or why, they abandoned their 1991 view that, the best of all worlds, would be, an iron-fisted Iraqi junta without Saddam Hussein, that would rule as Saddam did but not make the error of judgment in August 1990 that ruined Saddam's record. At the time, the incumbent's British allies were in the opposition and therefore more free than the Thatcherites, to speak out against Saddam's British-backed crimes. Their names are noteworthy by their absence from the parliamentary record of protests against these crimes, including Tony Blair, Jack Straw, Jeff Hoon, and other leading figures of New Labour. In December 2002, Jack Straw, then Foreign Minister, released a dossier of Saddam's crimes. It was drawn almost entirely from the period of firm US-UK support, a fact overlooked with the usual display of moral integrity. The timing and quality of the dossier raised many questions, but those aside, Straw failed to provide an explanation for his very recent conversion to skepticism about Saddam Hussein's good character and behavior. When Straw was Home Secretary in 2001, an Iraqi who fled to England after detention and torture requested asylum. Straw denied his request. The Home Office explained that Straw is aware that Iraq, and in particular the Iraqi security forces, would only convict and sentence a person in the courts with the provision of proper jurisdiction, so that, 
you could expect to receive a fair trial under an independent and properly constituted judiciary. Straw's conversion must, then, have been rather similar to President Clinton's discovery, sometime between September 8 and 11, 1999, that Indonesia had done some unpleasant things in East Timor in the past 25 years when it enjoyed decisive support from the U.S. and Britain. Attitudes toward democracy were revealed with unusual clarity during the mobilization for war in the fall of 2002, as it became necessary to deal somehow with the overwhelming popular opposition. Within the coalition of the willing, the U.S. public was at least partially controlled by the propaganda campaign unleashed in September. In Britain, the population was split roughly 50 50 on the war but the government maintained the stance of junior partner it had accepted reluctantly after World War II and had kept to even in the face of the contemptuous dismissal of British concerns by U.S. leaders at moments when the country's very survival was at stake. Outside the two full members of the coalition, problems were more serious. In the two major European countries, Germany and France, the official government stands corresponded to the views of the large majority of their populations, which unequivocally opposed the war. That led to bitter condemnation by Washington and many commentators. Donald Rumsfeld dismissed the offending nations as just the old Europe, of no concern because of their reluctance to tow Washington's line. The new Europe is symbolized by Italy, whose Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, was visiting the White House. It was, evidently, unproblematic that public opinion in Italy was overwhelmingly opposed to the war. The governments of old and new Europe were distinguished by a simple criterion. A government joined old Europe in its iniquity if and only if it took the same position as the vast majority of its population and refused to follow orders from Washington. Recall that the self-appointed rulers of the world, Bush, Powell, and the rest, had declared forthrightly that they intended to carry out their war whether or not the UN or anyone else catches up and becomes relevant. Old Europe, mired in irrelevance, did not catch up. Neither did New Europe, at least if people are part of their countries. Poll results available from Gallup International, as well as local sources for most of Europe, West and East, showed that support for a war carried out unilaterally by America and its allies did not rise above 11% in any country. Support for a war if mandated by the UN ranged from 13%, Spain, to 51%, Netherlands. Particularly interesting are the eight countries whose leaders declared themselves to be the new Europe, to much acclaim for their courage and integrity. Their declaration took the form of a statement calling on the Security Council to ensure full compliance with its resolutions, without specifying the means. Their announcement threatened to isolate the Germans and French, the press reported triumphantly though the positions of new and old Europe were in fact scarcely different. To ensure that Germany and France would be isolated, they were not invited to sign the bold pronouncement of new Europe, apparently for fear that they would do so, it was later quietly indicated. The standard interpretation is that the exciting and promising new Europe stood behind Washington, thus demonstrating that, Many Europeans supported the United States' view, even if France and Germany did not. Who were these, many Europeans? Checking polls, we find that in New Europe, opposition to the United States' view was for the most part even higher than in France and Germany, particularly in Italy and Spain, which were singled out for praise for their leadership of New Europe. Happily for Washington, Former communist countries too joined New Europe. Within them, support for the United States view, as defined by Powell. Namely, war by the coalition of the willing, without UN authorization, 
ranged from 4%, Macedonia, to 11%, Romania. Support for a war even with a UN mandate was also very low. Latvia's former foreign minister explained that we have to salute and shout, yes sir. We have to please America no matter what the cost. In brief, in journals that regard democracy as a significant value, headlines would have read that old Europe in fact included the vast majority of Europeans, East and West, while new Europe consisted of a few leaders who chose to line up, ambiguously, with Washington, disregarding the overwhelming opinion of their own populations. But actual reporting was mostly scattered and oblique, depicting opposition to the war as a marketing problem for Washington. Toward the liberal end of the spectrum, Richard Holbrook stressed the very important point that, if you add up the population of the eight countries of the original New Europe, it was larger than the population of those countries not signing the letter. True enough, though something is omitted, the populations were overwhelmingly opposed to the war, mostly even more so than in those countries dismissed as old Europe. At the other extreme of the spectrum, the editors of the Wall Street Journal applauded the statement of the eight original signers for exposing as fraudulent the conventional wisdom that France and Germany speak for all of Europe, and that all of Europe is now anti-American. The eight honorable new European leaders showed that the views of the continent's pro-American majority weren't being heard, apart from the editorial pages of the journal, now vindicated. The editors blasted the media to their left, a rather substantial segment, which appetled as true, the ridiculous idea that France and Germany spoke for Europe, when they were clearly a pitiful minority, and peddled these lies, because they served the political purposes of those, both in Europe and America, who oppose President Bush on Iraq. This conclusion does hold if we exclude Europeans from Europe, rejecting the radical left doctrine that people have some kind of role in democratic societies. Back among the liberals, Thomas Friedman suggested that France should be driven off the Security Council and replaced by India, which is a just so much more serious than France these days. France, as they say in kindergarten, does not play well with others, and therefore doesn't line up against Saddam, but is caught up with its need to differentiate itself from America in an effort to be unique. To translate, the French government acted in accord with popular opinion, which was opposed to Washington's war plans. Therefore France was. In kindergarten, though the population of New Europe must still have been in nursery school, judging by polls. India, on the other hand, is serious, now that it is governed by a proto-fascist party that is handing the country's resources to foreign multinationals while preaching an ultranationalist line for domestic purposes, and had just been implicated in a horrendous massacre of Muslims in Gujarat. And as Friedman has reported enthusiastically elsewhere, India has a wonderful software industry and sectors of great wealth, uninterestingly, also hundreds of millions of people living under some of the worst conditions in the world where the plight of women is not very different from life under the Taliban. All of this is of no concern as long as India is serious, just as life under the Taliban was of no concern as long as they were considered cooperative. Others preferred the Kagan boot stand, Berlusconi, Osnar, and the other Churchillian figures who joined Washington demonstrated unparalleled political courage, by keeping to their understanding of right and wrong instead of sheepishly succumbing to the paranoid, conspiratorial anti-Americanism of the vast majority of Europeans, who are driven by avarice, and therefore unable to comprehend the strain of idealism that makes America tick. True, those leaders made no discernible effort to enlighten the misguided populations whose views they disregarded while courageously lining up behind the most powerful military force in history.
but perhaps they are not really duplicates of Churchill and FDR standing up to Hitler, rather of President Bush, whose moral rectitude who derives from his evangelical zeal, as proven by the fact that his PR agents tell us so. There are many other illustrations. When Gerhard Schroeder dared to take the position of the overwhelming majority of German voters in the 2002 election, he was bitterly condemned for his shocking failure of leadership, one illustration of a serious problem. The government lives in fear of its voters, that Germany must overcome if it wants to be accepted in the civilized world. The case of Turkey is particularly revealing. Like others throughout the region, Turks despised Saddam Hussein but did not fear him. They also strongly opposed the war, about 90% in January 2003, when efforts were peaking to ensure that political leaders, if not their populations, would join Washington's enterprise. The government acted in accord with the will of the people. That shows that the elected government lacks democratic credentials, we learned on the day the polls were released. In a commentary by former ambassador to Turkey Morten Abramovitz, now a distinguished senior statesman and commentator. Ten years ago, he explained, most of Turkey, like today, was against any involvement in a war with Iraq. But there was one notable exception, President Turgut Özil, a true Democrat who overrode his countrymen's pronounced preference to stay out of the Gulf War. Sadly, however, the current leadership is now following the people when it comes to participating in another Iraq war, rather than succumbing to intense pressures from Washington. Regrettably, Abramovitz sighed, for the U.S. there is no true Democrat around, as there was ten years ago. Demonstrating still more clearly the lack of Democratic credentials of the governing party, its unofficial leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, not only criticized Washington's rush to war but took a step into truly forbidden territory, criticizing countries, the U.S. included, that built up their own weapons of mass destruction while trying to force others to get rid of theirs. As U.S. pressures mounted, Turkey's democracy began to improve. While popular opinion apparently turned even more strongly against the war, the government finally yielded to severe U.S. economic and other coercion, and agreed to comply with Washington's demands over overwhelming popular opposition. A Western diplomat, probably from the U.S. Embassy, told the press that he was encouraged by the decision and found it a very positive thing. Turkey correspondent Amberin Zaman added that a war against Iraq remains deeply unpopular among the Turkish population. That is why Thursday's parliamentary session was closed to the public and balloting was secret. Headlines were stinging in their criticism of Turkey's ruling Justice and Development Party on Friday. The front page of the respected Daily Radical said, the parliament ran away from the people. With near unanimity, Turks opposed Washington's orders, but it was understood that the leadership must obey, and Turkey joined New Europe. Or so it ap. Eared. In the end, the Turks proceeded to teach a lesson in democracy to the West. Parliament finally refused to allow U.S. troops to be deployed fully in Turkey. To formulate the outcome within the conventional framework. The ground war has been hampered because Turkey did not accept its role as host of the Northern Front forces, again for political reasons. Its government was too weak in the face of anti-war feeling. The presuppositions are clear. Strong governments disregard their populations and accept the role assigned to them by the global ruler. Weak governments succumb to the will of 95% of their population. The crucial point was expressed clearly by Pentagon planner Paul Wolfowitz. He too berated the Turkish government for its misbehavior, but went on to condemn the military, 
who it did not play the strong leadership role that we would have expected but betrayed weakness in permitting the government to honor near-unanimous public opinion. Turkey, he argued, had therefore to step up and say, we made a mistake let's figure out how we can be as helpful as possible to the Americans. Wolfowitz's stand is particularly instructive because he is presented as the leading visionary in the crusade to democratize the Middle East. The pronouncements about the old and new Europe, and the hysteria that often accompanied them, provide some informative lessons about prevailing attitudes toward democracy among political and intellectual elites. Dislike of democracy is nothing new. For obvious reasons, it is a traditional stance of those who have a share in power and privilege. But it is rarely so starkly illuminated. That may help explain why establishment critics scarcely refer to the democratization rhetoric that accompanies the political leadership's dramatic display of contempt for democracy, evidently widely shared, to judge by commentary. Knowledgeable commentators have pointed to the uncomfortable dualism in Bush's foreign policy, with Bush the neo-Reaganite making ringing calls for a vigorous new democracy campaign in the Middle East, while policy imperatives tempt Washington to put aside its democratic scruples and seek closer ties with autocracies, as in the past, with remarkable consistency. Reviewing this dualism and the continuing support for brutal and repressive regimes, Thomas Carruthers expressed his hope that Bush would shift to the true spirit of President Ronald Reagan's foreign policy, with its attempts to spread democracy. These hopes are particularly interesting because of their source. Carruthers has done some of the most careful work elucidating the true spirit of Reaganite dedication to democracy. He combines the standpoint of a scholar with that of an insider having been a participant in the Reagan State Department's democracy enhancement projects in Latin America. He regards these programs as sincere, but a failure. Where Washington's influence was least, in the southern cone of Latin America, there was progress toward democracy, which the Reagan administration sought to impede but finally accepted. Where Washington's influence was greatest, success was least. The reason, Carruthers explains, is that the Reaganite yearning for democracy was restricted to limited, top-down forms of democratic change that did not risk upsetting the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied. Washington sought to maintain the basic order of quite undemocratic societies and to avoid a populist-based change. Carruthers recognizes that there is a liberal critique of the Reaganite approach, but he rejects it because of its perennial weak spot, it offers no alternative. The option of allowing the population a meaningful voice in running their own affairs is not an alternative, not even to be dismissed. Carruthers also does not discuss the dedicated efforts during those years to undermine the threat of more meaningful democracy where it arose. The targeted populations are well aware of the nature of the democracy that is being brought to them. It has been regularly observed that the extension of formal democracy in Latin America has been accompanied by increasing disillusionment about democracy. One reason, pointed out some years ago by Argentine political scientist Atilio Boron, is that the new wave of democratization in Latin America has coincided with neoliberal economic reforms, which undermine effective democracy. The post-war Bretton Woods system was based on capital controls and relatively fixed currencies, not only in the expectation of economic benefit, as proved to be the case, but also to allow government space to carry out highly popular social democratic policies. It was understood that the kind of financial liberalization that opened the neoliberal era in the 1970s reduces the options for democratic choice, transferring decisions to the hands of a virtual Senate 
of investors and lenders. Governments now face a, a dual constituency conundrum, which pits the interests of voters against foreign currency traders and hedge fund managers, who conduct a moment-to-moment -moment referendum on the economic and financial policies of developing and developed nations alike, and the competition is highly unequal. John Maynard Keynes warned 70 years ago that nothing less than the democratic experiment in self-government was endangered by the threat of global financial market forces. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States, a strong advocate of neoliberal globalization, opened the annual session by warning that free movement of capital, the most undesirable feature of globalization, in fact, its core feature, is the greatest obstacle to democratic governance, just as Keynes had warned. The fears go back to Adam Smith. His sole use of the phrase, invisible hand, in Wealth of Nations is in a discussion of the harmful consequences of foreign investment, which England need not fear, he believed, because an invisible hand will induce investors to keep their capital at home. The same is true of other parts of the neoliberal package, privatization, for example, reduces the arena of potential democratic choice, dramatically in the case of liberalization of services, which has evoked enormous popular opposition. Even in narrow economic terms, the privatization programs were imposed with little if any solid empirical evidence or theoretical grounding. Disillusionment with formal democracy has been evident in the U.S. as well, increasing through the neoliberal period. There was much clamor about the stolen election of November 2000, and surprise that the public did not seem to care very much. Likely reasons are suggested by public opinion studies, which reveal that on the eve of the election, Three-quarters of the population regarded it as a game played by large contributors, party leaders, and the PR industry, which crafted candidates to say almost anything to get themselves elected. On almost all issues, citizens could not identify the stands of the candidates, as intended. Issues on which the public differs from elite opinion are generally off the agenda. Voters were directed to personal qualities, not issues. Among voters, heavily skewed toward the wealthy, those who recognize their class interests to be at stake tend to vote to protect those interests, for the more reactionary of the two business parties. But the general public splits its vote in other ways, sometimes, as in 2000, leading to a statistical tie. Among working people, non-economic issues such as gun ownership and irreligiosity were leading factors, so that people often voted against their own primary interests, apparently assuming that they had little choice. In 2000, feelings of powerlessness reached the highest level recorded, over 50 percent. What remains of democracy is largely the right to choose among commodities. Business leaders have long explained the need to impose on the population a philosophy of futility and lack of purpose in life, to concentrate human attention on the more superficial things that comprise much of fashionable consumption. Deluged by such propaganda from infancy, people may then accept their meaningless and subordinate lives and forget ridiculous ideas about managing their own affairs. They may abandon their fate to corporate managers and the PR industry and, in the political realm, to the self-described, intelligent minorities who serve and administer power. From this perspective, conventional in elite opinion, the November 2000 elections did not reveal a flaw of U.S. democracy, but rather its triumph. And generalizing, it is fair to hail the triumph of democracy throughout the hemisphere, and elsewhere, even though the populations do not see it that way. Liberation from tyranny, constructive solutions. The implausibility of the belief that Washington is suddenly concerned with. Democracy and human rights in Iraq, 
or elsewhere, should not prevent the wild men in the wings from persisting in their commitment to these ends and, to the extent possible, exerting influence in that direction. In the case of Iraq, there was always good reason to take seriously the conclusions of the most knowledgeable observers that a constructive solution to regime change in Iraq would be to lift the economic sanctions that have impoverished society, decimated the Iraqi middle class and eliminated any possibility for the emergence of alternative leadership, while 12 years of sanctions have only strengthened the current regime, Hans von Sponeck. Furthermore, the sanctions compelled the population to depend for survival on the reigning tyranny, reducing even more the likelihood of a constructive solution. We have sustained the regime and denied the opportunities for change, Dennis Halliday added. I believe if the Iraqis had their economy, had their lives back, and had their way of life restored, they would take care of the form of governance that they want that they believe is suitable to their country. Were these illusions? The historical record hardly suggests so. Again, consider the fate of the miserable tyrants supported by the current incumbents until the very end of their bloody rule, all overthrown by internal revolt. The case of So Escu, only one of many, is particularly instructive because of the nature of the internal tyrannies. As priorities shifted in 2002, it was claimed that those who shared responsibility for 20 years of torture of Iraqis were entitled to resort to violence, to bring about democracy. Even their consistent record of support for savagery and tyranny and their hostility to democracy, demonstrated with unusual passion at that very moment, provided no reason to question the proclaimed intentions. But suspending disbelief, violence can be considered only if constructive solutions have clearly failed. Since such solutions were not even permitted in the case of Iraq, it can hardly be maintained that the stage of last resort had been reached. That conclusion holds whatever one's subjective judgments may be about the likelihood of success, all basically irrelevant. To paraphrase Lisa Marlowe, if this is to be the model for the hegemonic superpower, heaven help us all. Since the reagan bush I years, in fact before, Washington had supported Saddam Hussein in varying ways. After he stepped out of line in August 1990, policies and pretexts varied, but one element remained constant. The people of Iraq must not control their country. To repeat, the tyrant was permitted to suppress the 1991 uprising because, we were informed, Washington sought a military junta that would rule the country with an iron fist, and if no alternative is available, Saddam would have to do. The rebels failed because very few people outside Iraq wanted them to win, meaning Washington and its local allies, who held the strikingly unanimous view that, whatever the sins of the Iraqi leader, he offered the West and the region a better hope for his country's stability than did those who have suffered his repression. It was impressive to see how uniformly all of this was suppressed in the shocked commentary, and reporting on the exposure of the mass graves of the victims of Saddam's U.S. authorized paroxysm of terror, offered as justification for the recent war on immoral grounds now that we have seen the mass graves and the true extent of Saddam's genocidal evil, all known at once in 1991 but ignored because of the imperative of instability. The uprising would have left the country in the hands of Iraqis who might have been independent of Washington. The sanctions of the following years undercut the possibility of the kind of popular revolt that had overthrown other monsters who were also strongly supported by the current incumbents. The U.S. sought to instigate coups by groups it controlled, but a popular rebellion would not have left the U.S. in charge. At the Azores summit in March 2003, Bush reiterated that stand, declaring that the U.S. would invade even if Saddam and his cohorts were to leave the country.
the question of who should rule Iraq remains a prime issue of contention. Leading figures of the U.S.-backed opposition demanded at once that the U.N. play a vital role in post-war Iraq, and rejected U.S. control of Reconstruction or of the post-Saddam government. They strongly opposed U.S. hegemony over Iraq. Even Washington's chosen figures vigorously protested the plans to sideline them in favor of a U.S. occupation. There were also indications that the Shiite majority might support an Islamic republic if given a voice, hardly to the taste of Washington and its plans for the region. There seems little reason to doubt that U.S. policymakers will attempt to follow the consistent practice elsewhere. Formal democracy is fine but only if it obeys orders, like New Europe, or the limited top-down democracies in Latin America run by the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied, Carruthers. Brent Scowcroft, National Security Advisor for Bush I, spoke for the moderates when he observed that if there is an election in Iraq and the radicals win, we're surely not going to let them take over. Thus if the Shiite majority has a significant voice in post-Saddam Iraq and joins others in the region in trying to improve relations with Iran, they will be a radicals and treated accordingly. One can only expect the same if secular Democrats win who prove to be a radicals, unless we decide that history is bunk. The basic lines of U.S. thinking were illustrated in the organization chart of the Civil Administration of Post-War Iraq. There are 16 boxes, each containing a name in boldface and a designation of the person's responsibility, from Presidential Envoy Paul Bremer at the top, answering to the Pentagon, down through the chart. Seven are generals, most of the rest government officials, none Iraqis. At the very bottom, there is a seventeenth box, about one-third the size of the others, with no names, no boldface, and no functions, it reads, Iraqi Ministry Advisors. Some puzzled notice has been taken of the change in U.S. policy with regard to post-war control in Iraq. Elsewhere, Washington has been happy to transfer responsibility and costs to others, but in Iraq, it has insisted on running the show itself. There is no inconsistency. Iraq is not East Timor, Kosovo, and Afghanistan, Condoleezza. Rice rightly stressed. She did not spell out the distinction. Perhaps it is too transparent, Iraq is a major prize, the others are considered basket cases. Therefore Washington must be in charge, not the UN not the Iraqi people. Putting aside the crucial question of who will be in charge, those concerned with the tragedy of Iraq had three basic goals, 1. Overthrowing the tyranny, 2. Ending the sanctions that were targeting the people, not the rulers, and 3. Preserving some semblance of world order. There can be no disagreement among decent people on the first two goals, achieving them is an occasion for rejoicing particularly for those who protested U.S. support for Saddam before his invasion of Kuwait and again immediately afterward, and opposed the sanctions regime that followed, they can therefore applaud the outcome without hypocrisy. The second goal could surely have been achieved, and possibly the first as well, without undermining the third. The Bush administration openly declared its intention to dismantle what remained of the system of world order, and to control the world by force, with Iraq serving as the petri dish, as the New York Times called it, for establishing the new norms. It was that declared intention that elicited fear and often hatred throughout the world, and despair among those who are not content to live in infamy and are concerned about the likely consequences of choosing to do so. That is of course a choice, one that is very largely in the hands of the American people. Chapter 6 Dilemmas of Dominance Enthusiasm about the new Europe of the former Soviet Empire is not solely based on the fact that its leadership is willing to 
salute and shout, yes sir. More fundamental reasons were articulated as the European Union considered extension of membership to these countries. The U.S. strongly supported this move. The countries of the East are Europe's real modernizers, political commentator David Ignatius explained. They can blow apart the bureaucratism and welfare state culture that still hobble much of Europe, and let free markets function the way they should, as in the U.S., where the economy relies heavily on the state sector. And the current incumbents broke post-war records in protectionism during their first tenure in office. Since, the freedom-loving, technology-adapting people of the East are paid a small fraction of what workers in the West earn, Ignatius continues, they can drive all of Europe toward the realities of modern capitalism, the American model, apparently ideal by definition. The model has per capita growth rates approximately equal to Europe's and unemployment at about the same level, along with the highest rates of inequality and poverty, the highest workloads, and some of the weakest benefits and support systems in the advanced industrial world. The median male wage in 2000 was still below the 1979 level after the late 90s boomlet, though productivity was 45% higher one sign of the sharp shift toward benefits for capital that is being accelerated more radically under Bush too. The potential contributions of Eastern Europe to undermining quality of life for the majority in the West was recognized immediately, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The business press was exultant about the green shoots in communism's ruins, where Rising unemployment and pauperization of large sections of the industrial working class meant that people were willing to work longer hours than their pampered colleagues in the West, at 40% of the wages and with few benefits. Further green shoots include enough repression to keep working people in line and attractive state subsidies for Western investors. These market reforms would enable Europe to hammer away at high wages and corporate taxes, short working hours, labor immobility, and luxurious social programs. Europe would be able to follow the American pattern, where the decline of real wages in the Reagan years to the lowest level among the advanced industrial societies, apart from Britain, was a welcome development of transcendent importance. With communism's ruins playing something like the role of Mexico, the advantages can now be brought to Western Europe as well, driving it toward the U.S.-British model. Communism's ruins have many advantages over the regions that have been under unbroken Western domination for centuries. Those on the eastern side of the 500-year-old fault line dividing East and West, not quite that of the Cold War, but similar enjoyed much higher standards of health and education after the East exited from its status as the West's original a third world, and they even have the right skin color. With the return of something like traditional relationships, the East can now provide other benefits, including a huge flood of easily exploited labor. The Ukraine is now reported to be replacing Southern Europe as the source of cheap labor in the West depriving the collapsing Ukrainian economy of its most productive workers. Like their counterparts from Central America, Ukrainian emigrants send back enormous remittances, thus helping to keep what remains of the society alive. Working and living conditions are so awful that death rates are high, and perhaps 100,000 Ukrainian women are held in sexual slavery. Not an unfamiliar story. It is clear enough why the de facto world government, described in the business press, should welcome Eastern Europe's market reforms. But for U.S. elites they have a further significance. Like independent social and economic development in the third world, Western Europe's social market system could be a virus that might infect others, hence a form of a successful defiance that must be dispatched to oblivion. The European welfare state systems could have a dangerous impact on American public opinion.
as revealed by the continued popularity in the U.S. of a universal tax-based healthcare system. Despite constant denigration in the media and the exclusion of the option from the electoral agenda on grounds that it is politically impossible, no matter what the public may think about it. The irrealities of modern capitalism, illustrated in the regions long subject to Western control have been brought to much of Eastern Europe as its economies have been Latin Americanized. The reasons are debated, but the essential facts of the social and economic collapse are not. The demographic consequences, while uncertain in scale, provide one index. The UN Development Programme estimates 10 million excess male deaths during the 1990s, approximately the toll of Stalin's purge 60 years earlier, if these figures are near accurate. Russia appears to be the first country to experience such a sharp decrease in births versus deaths, for reasons other than war, famine or disease, David Powell writes. The demographic crisis is in part attributed to the crumbling of Russia's healthcare system under market reforms. The general collapse has been so severe that even the monstrous Stalin is remembered with some appreciation. More than half of Russians believe Stalin's role in Russian history was positive, while only a third disagreed. Polls indicated in early 2003. The plans of the U.S. overseers of Iraq seem rather similar to those that were applied in Russia, and that have led to dismal outcomes elsewhere with fair consistency. On European unification, Washington's attitudes have always been complex. Like its predecessors, the Kennedy administration pressed for European unity, but with some concern that Europe might go its own way. The respected senior diplomat David Bruce was a leading advocate for European unification in the Kennedy years, but, typically, saw dangers if Europe struck off on its own, seeking to play a role independent of the United States. The guiding principles were well expressed by Henry Kissinger in his Year of Europe address in 1973. The world system, he advised, should be based on the recognition that the United States has global interests and responsibilities, while its allies have only regional interests. The U.S. must be concerned more with the overall framework of order than with the management of every regional enterprise. Europe must not pursue its own independent course, based on its Franco-German industrial and financial heartland. Another reason for concern about old Europe, quite apart from the reluctance of its governments to follow Washington's commands with regard to the Iraq War. The principles remain in force despite changing circumstances. Quite apart from their potential contributions to undermining the social market systems of Western Europe, Eastern European countries are expected to be a, a Trojan horse for U.S. interests undermining any drift toward an independent role in the world. By 1973, U.S. global dominance had declined from its post-World War II peak. One measure is U.S. control of the world's wealth, which is estimated to have shrunk from roughly 50% to half of that as the world economy moved to a, a tripolar order, with three major power centers, North America, Europe, and Japan-based Asia. These structures have since been modified further, particularly with the rise of the East Asian Tigers and the entry of China into the global system as a major player. The basic concerns about the prospect of an independent Europe extend to Asia as well, in new ways. Long before World War II, the U.S. was by far the greatest economic power in the world but not a leading actor in global management. The war changed that. Rival powers were either devastated or severely weakened, while the U.S. gained enormously. Industrial production almost quadrupled under the semi-command economy. By 1945 the U.S. had not only overwhelming economic dominance but also a position of incomparable security. It controlled the hemisphere, 
the surrounding oceans, and most of the territory bordering them. U.S. planners moved quickly to organize the global system, following plans that had already been developed to satisfy the requirements of the United States in a world in which it proposed to hold unquestioned power, while limiting the sovereignty of those who might pose a challenge. The new global order was to be subordinated to the needs of the U.S. economy and subject to U.S. political control, as much as possible. Imperial controls, especially the British, were to be dismantled while Washington extended its own regional systems in Latin America and the Pacific on the principle, explained by Abe Fortas, that, what was good for us was good for the world. This altruistic concern was not appreciated by the British Foreign Office. Officials recognized that Washington, guided by the economic imperialism of American business interests, is attempting to elbow us out, but could do little about it. The Minister of State at the Foreign Office commented to his cabinet colleagues that Americans believe that the United States stands for something in the world, something of which the world has need, something which the world is going to like, something, in the final analysis, which the world is going to take, whether it likes it or not. He was articulating the real-world version of Wilsonian idealism, the version that conforms to the historical record. U.S. planning at the time was sophisticated and thorough. The highest priority was to reconstruct the industrial world along lines that would satisfy the requirements of the business, interests that dominate policy formation, in particular, to absorb U.S. manufacturing surpluses, overcome the dollar gap, and offer opportunities for investment. The outcomes were appreciated by the domestic beneficiaries. Reagan's Commerce Department observed that the Marshall Plan set the stage for large amounts of private U.S. direct investment in Europe, laying the groundwork for multinational corporations, MNCs. Business Week described MNCs in 1975 as the economic expression of the political framework established by post-war policymakers in which American business prospered and expanded on overseas orders. Fueled initially by the dollars of the Marshall Plan, and protected from negative developments by the umbrella of American power. Other parts of the world were assigned their functions by State Department planners. Thus Southeast Asia was to provide resources and raw materials to the former imperial masters, crucially Britain but also Japan, which was to be granted some sort of empire toward the South in the phrase of George Kennan, head of the State Department's policy planning staff. Some areas were of little interest to the planners, notably Africa, which Kennan advised should be handed over to Europeans to exploit for their reconstruction. A different post-war Europe-Africa relationship comes to mind in the light of history but does not seem to have been considered. The Middle East, in contrast, was to be taken over by the United States. In 1945, State Department officials described Saudi Arabian energy resources as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. The Gulf region generally was considered probably the richest economic prize in the field of foreign investment. Eisenhower later described it as the most strategically important area of the world. Britain agreed. Its planners described the resources of the region in 1947 as a vital prize for any power interested in world influence or domination. France was expelled from the Middle East by legalistic maneuvers, and Britain declined over time to junior partner. Kennan, who was farsighted, recognized that by controlling Japan's supplies of energy, primarily in the Middle East at the time, the U.S. would achieve some veto power over Japan's potential military and industrial policy, though Japanese prospects were generally disparaged at the time. The issue has been the source of continued conflict since, 
with regard to Europe as well, as both Europe and Japan have sought a degree of energy independence. Meanwhile Asia was changing. A prestigious task force, reporting in 2003, described Northeast Asia as the epicenter of international commerce and technological innovation. The fastest-growing economic region in the world for much of the past two decades, by now accounting for nearly 30% of global GDP, far ahead of the United States, and also holding about half of global foreign exchange reserves. These economies also account for nearly half of global inbound foreign direct investment, and are becoming an increasing source of outbound FDI, flowing within East Asia and to Europe and North America, which now trade more with Northeast Asia than with each other. The region is, furthermore, an integrated one. Eastern Russia is rich in natural resources, for which the industrial centers of Northeast Asia are the natural market. Integration would be enhanced by economic unification of the two Koreas with gas pipelines passing through North Korea and extension of the Trans-Siberian Railroad on the same course. North Korea was the most dangerous and ugly member of the axis of evil, but lowest on the target list. Like Iran, but unlike Iraq, it failed the first of the criteria for a legitimate target, it was not defenseless. Presumably, the Pentagon is working on ways to knock out the North Korean deterrent, massed artillery aimed at Seoul and U.S. forces, which are being withdrawn out of artillery range, arousing concerns in Korea about U.S. intentions. Considered in isolation, North Korea also fails the second criterion for a target, it is one of the poorest and most miserable countries in the world. But as part of the Northeast Asia complex, it gains importance for the reasons indicated by the task force. Hence it is not an unlikely target of attack, if the technical problem of countering its deterrent can be overcome. The task force recommends that Washington seek a diplomatic solution to the current crisis. It should continue the process, begun haltingly and unevenly under Clinton, aimed at normalizing United States economic and political relations with North Korea, guaranteeing the security of a non-nuclear North Korea, promoting the reconciliation of North and South Korea, and drawing North Korea into economic engagement with its neighbors. Such interactions could accelerate economic reforms already underway in North Korea, leading in time to a diffusion of economic power that would loosen totalitarian political controls and moderate human rights abuses. These policies would conform to the regional consensus, including the North Korean dictatorship, it appears. The alternative, confrontation in the manner of Bush-Rumsfeld-Cheney grand strategy, is the road to perdition, the task force argues. The recommended alternative poses certain problems, however. As the task force describes, Northeast Asia is a rapidly developing and integrated region, which might go off on an independent course, just as continental Europe might. That raises the problem Kissinger outlined. In 1998 the National Bureau of Asian Research warned that, Pipelines that promote greater regional integration in Northeast Asia might exclude U.S. involvement except in a marginal way, and could accelerate a process of evolution into regional blocks. These pipelines could enhance regional stability and provide a cheap alternative to oil imported. From the Middle East, Selig Harrison adds, but, the United States seems uneasily wary of pipeline networks in Northeast Asia. The U.S. is aware that the countries of the region want to reduce what they find to be an increasingly uncomfortable reliance on the U.S., or from another point of view, the veto power the U.S. exercises by virtue of its control of Middle East oil and the sea lanes for tanker traffic. The threat of potential independence may prove an impediment to diplomatic settlement. For partially related reasons, 
China is regarded as a prime potential enemy by Washington hawks, and much military planning is geared to that contingency. Recent efforts to strengthen India-US strategic relations are partly motivated by the same concerns, along with Washington's concerns about its control over the world's largest energy reserves in the Middle East. Washington's approach to North Korea resembles its stance on Iran and pre-invasion Iraq. In all three cases, neighboring countries had been pursuing efforts to overcome hostility and move toward integration, also attempting to lend support to reformist tendencies, or at least help lay the basis for them, and those efforts continue. With regard to Iran and North Korea, the U.S. somewhat hesitant followed a similar approach toward North Korea during the Clinton years, with partial success, but apart from that, Washington has preferred confrontation. While the reasons for that preference are not identical in the three cases, there are common threads, which become clearer in the context of the grand strategy. In the early post-war years, U.S. planners sought to fashion East and Southeast Asia into a Japan-centered system within the overall framework of order maintained by the U.S. The basic framework was outlined in the San Francisco Peace Treaty, SFPT, of 1951, which formally ended the war in Asia. Apart from the three French colonies in Indochina, the only Asian countries that accepted the SFPT were Pakistan and Ceylon, both recently freed from British rule and remote from the Asian War. India refused to attend the San Francisco Conference because of the terms of the treaty, among them the U.S. insistence on retaining Okinawa as a military base, as it still does, over strong protests from Okinawans, whose voices barely register in the U.S. Truman was outraged by India's disobedience. His reaction, no less elegant than the current reaction to the disobedience of old Europe and Turkey, was that India must have consulted Uncle Joe and Mao Zedong of China. The white man got a name, not just a vulgar epithet. Partly that may be ordinary racism, or perhaps it is because Truman genuinely liked and admired old Joe, who reminded him of the Missouri boss who had launched his political career. In the late 1940s, Truman found Old Joe to be a decent fellow, though a prisoner of the Politburo, who can't do what he wants to. Mao Zedong, however, was a yellow devil. These distinctions extended wartime propaganda. Nazis were evil but merited a certain respect, in the stereotype, at least, they were blonde, blue-eyed, orderly, far more appealing than the frogs, whom Truman particularly disliked, not to speak of the wops. And they were a wholly different species from the Japs, who were vermin to be crushed, at least once they became enemies, before that, the U.S. was ambivalent about Japanese depredations in Asia, as long as U.S. business interests were protected. The primary victims of Japanese fascism and its predecessors, China and the Japanese colonies of Korea and Formosa, Taiwan, did not attend the San Francisco Peace Conference and were accorded no serious concern. Koreans and Chinese received no reparations from Japan, nor did the Philippines, which also did not attend the conference. Secretary of State Dulles condemned Filipinos for the emotional prejudices that kept them from grasping why they would have no relief for the torture they had endured. Initially, Japan was to pay reparations, but only to the U.S. and other colonial powers, despite the fact that the war was a Japanese war of aggression in Asia through the 1930s and only became a U.S.-led Western war with Japan after Pearl Harbor. Japan was also to reimburse the U.S. for the costs of the occupation. For its Asian victims, Japan was to pay a compensation, in the form of export of Japanese manufacturing products using Southeast Asian resources, a central part of the arrangements that, in effect, reconstructed something like the New Order in Asia.
that Japan had attempted to construct by conquest, but was now gaining under U.S. domination, so that it was unproblematic. Some Asian victims of Japanese fascism, forced laborers and prisoners of war, brought suit against Japanese corporations with subsidiaries in the U.S., the legal successors of those responsible for the crimes. On the eve of the 50th anniversary of the SFPT, their suit was dismissed by a California judge, on grounds that their claims were barred by the terms of the SFPT. Relying on an amicus brief filed by the State Department in support of the accused Japanese corporations, the court ruled that the SFPT had served to sustain U.S. security interests in Asia and to support peace and stability in the region. Asia historian John Price described this judgment as one of the more abysmal moments of denial, pointing out that at least 10 million people had been killed in wars in the region while Asia was enjoying peace and stability. In May 2003, John Ashcroft's Justice Department updated the stand of Clinton's State Department, submitting an amicus brief in support of the energy giant Unocal that would roll back 20 years of judicial rulings for victims of human rights abuse, Human Rights Watch warned. The Justice Department brief goes far beyond defense of the Energy Corporation against charges of brutal treatment of Burmese workers, slave laborers in effect. It calls for a radical reinterpretation of the Alien Tort Claims Act, ATCA, which permits victims of serious violations of international law abroad to seek civil damages in U.S. courts against their alleged abusers who are found in the United States. The Bush administration is the first to call for reversing court decisions upholding the ATCA. It is a craven attempt to protect human rights abusers at the expense of victims, HRW Executive Director Kenneth Roth observes, particularly when the abusers are energy corporations, a cynic might add. The tripolar order that was taking shape from the early 1970s has since become more firm, and with it, the concern of U.S. planners that not only Europe but also Asia might seek a more independent course. From a longer historical perspective, that would not be too surprising. In the 18th century, China and India were major commercial and industrial centers. East Asia was far ahead of Europe in public health and probably sophistication of market systems. Life expectancy in Japan may have been higher than in Europe. England was trying to catch up in textiles and other manufactures borrowing from India in ways that are now called piracy and are banned in the international trade agreements imposed by the rich states. Under a cynical pretense of free trade, the U.S. relied heavily on the same mechanisms, as have other states that have developed. As late as the mid-19th century, British observers claimed that Indian iron was as good as or better than British iron, and much cheaper. Colonization and forced liberalization converted India to a British dependency. It only resumed its growth and ended murderous famines after independence. China was not subjugated until the Second British Opium War 150 years ago, and also only resumed development after independence. Japan was the only part of Asia to resist colonization successfully, and the only one to develop, along with its colonies. It is not, then, a great surprise that Asia is returning to a position of considerable wealth and power after regaining sovereignty. These long-term historical processes, however, extend the problems of sustaining the overall framework of order, in which others must respect their proper place. The problems are not restricted to successful defiance in the third world, a major theme of the Cold War years, but reach the industrial heartlands themselves. Violence is a powerful instrument of control, as history demonstrates. But the dilemmas of dominance are not slight.